get by Benning. Darnell Nurse left it in the corner, gets up center. Perry scoops. Corey Perry. Well, you able to shake away from Solani. It's given away to Solani. Around in front. Score! Tamu Solani with the steal. Three of the fans score one. Score! Off the floor! On the board! Paul Terrier! Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Forever Mighty Podcast. Uh, I am here with uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Eduardo. How are you doing, Eddie? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's a good night. So we've had this one in the um, the queue for a while, so it's nice to to get it going and get, uh, yeah. get into it. So Yeah, I mean, I don't know <laughs> why uh, anything that was uh, associated this podcast would take longer to do. Uh, that doesn't track as normal at all. Uh, so, uh, to quote the great Jeff Merritt, uh, what is he, what is it, uh, good, like smart borrows or something and then greatness steals. Wow. Can't even get the quote right. This is off to a great start. (laughs) Basically, uh, there is a soccer website, uh, called Optijo and for, uh, a while now they've been doing these really interesting things where they'll look at like a position of need uh, for different teams and they will look at kind of different types of answers uh, to that positional need and me and Edward have stolen that kind of idea um, and have applied it to kind of the big picture uh, lineup projection for uh, the Ducks going into next year you know, there's a lot of turnover. We just saw four guys leave at the deadline. Brian Getzloff retired. Uh, there's a handful of free agents and restricted free agents, and uh, any of them could stay, and more than a few of them could could leave. Um, you know, and you know, I think the thing that made it really interesting to me is Anaheim is so clearly in flux right now that looking at these positional needs and trying to answer them, I think provides a kind of an, an interesting insight into kind of where the roster is at. Um, so with that in mind, we kind of tried to build a, an opening night 20-man roster, basically, or lineup. And I guess the first thing that I will say is we... Uh, I'll probably add a tweet or something. But anyways, so we just kind of tried to do what made the most sense. So like the first line, the left wing is open. Zegris is at center. Terry is at right wing. Second line, Comtois, Henrique at center, empty on the right. Line three, uh, we have Jones and Silverberg as the wingers, but with no third center set. And the fourth line, we have... Uh, Grant as the only fourth liner under contract. Uh, we started this before Sam Carrick uh, signed his extension, so we'll probably end up getting into that a little bit. Uh, as for defense, uh, Fowler and Drysdale are the top pair. Then you need a second pairing left defenseman to play with Shattenkirk. And then we had Mahura, because he's still under contract, uh, as the left pair, the third guy on the left meaning we needed a right third pair guy uh and then we have john moore and his weird contract kind of listed there you know uh as an extra guy just to kind of fill in some space i guess just kind of help me because i'm the one who put the stupid thing together uh try to make sure i could visualize everything and then goalies you know we felt pretty took care of itself gibby stellars dostal as the uh the guy who's going to be on the tweener or if somebody gets hurt or sick or something like that or if Gibby moves uh, or Stolarz moves, it looks like Dostal's the guy who will get the call up. Yeah, we'll have to add to it at that point. We'll have to find uh, <clears throat> either. Uh, well, I guess we won't have to find a backup, but like a third, third string goalie, a third choice. Yeah, I mean, well, I think in that case, the question would be: Is did a goalie come back, yeah. and is that goalie going to step into a one A role with Stolarz? Mirazik. Oh man, uh, Jack Campbell's well, not coming back. <laughs> Something's got to happen. <laughs> uh, it's going to be so much fun. Uh, so we're just going to kind of go down the lineup um, and kind of just talk about the different players we picked. So like I said, uh, they looked at different ways to answer it. Uh, the four um, 
I guess, categories is a good way to say it. As, as we looked at it is a dream target, just pie in the sky. What's, you know, the, the perfect guy in your opinion for that role, uh, a low risk, low cost option. So more of the kind of, I think what a lot of us expect to be kind of the case, you know, a, a guy who can fill a spot kind of, uh, in a lot of ways, what, uh, Dominic Simone and Zach Aston Reese were in that deal coming back. They're guys who can just fill roles in the middle six and they're competent guys. The Bob Murray uh, special. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, then we had what we referred to as the internal option where we tried to look at guys who were either in the system or in the minors or something like that, or, or even if they're RFA, UFA kind of guy uh, that they already kind of have their hands on, they have some familiarity with, and they can put into that role. And then the last one was a wild card, uh, which me and Eddie decided to do just to, you know, give ourselves a little bit of extra freedom as far as silly ideas and uh, get into it. So I guess the place to start would be, well, I guess, Eddie, which position do you want to start with? We can kind of bounce around, actually, now that I think about it. It doesn't actually matter. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we should, well, we're gonna, we should start with forwards and then we'll move on defense. Okay. I'm wondering if we should start from the bottom and do mm-hmm. the less interesting ones first and get to the top, because obviously the more interesting players are the, the ones who are going to fill the top lineup, or we should go top down. I'm thinking we should go bottom up and start with I the fourth so line, guys. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. All right, so we're going to start um, with the two fourth line forwards that, uh, that we've got to fill. Okay. Yeah, and so just again, like uh, we probably should have talked about this before we started, but who gives a shit? Uh, you know, we are uh, we're going to tell you who we picked. Uh, but for the fourth line forwards, the thing with it is, is we just picked two forwards because the, the position on the fourth line, I think is, is really up for grabs. You've got Grant who has played in all three positions. Um, Even Carrick has too. We didn't include him, but he's played wing and center before. So exactly. So I, we just kind of were like not to get too bogged down. What are two good bottom line fourth you know fourth line guys that you can bring in uh and eddie who are your two guys yeah like or... th- this is the only one i think where we didn't have somebody the same yeah. <laughs> out of all of them which i guess makes sense because it's fourth line guys um and you knew i wasn't gonna put you know who on there that that was i don't know what happen. you're talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, i guess i'll start with my dream targets like this is the the funnest part for me of the fourth line is just trying to find dream targets for <laughs> for yeah. fourth line guys so um, everybody knows, or if you follow this on, on, I know the podcast has been kind of off and on lately, but, um, Pat and I have had it out over Nick Deloria since him getting traded. And the, the whole gist of my argument, we've had this on the podcast was if you're going to have guys on the fourth line who can be physical and fight and whatever, they need to do something else. So I was looking for guys who could either drive play or be like Sam Carrick where they can chip in offensively, but are still, you know, still have a, a positive defensive impact on the team. So my two kind of pie in the sky, you know, dream targets for uh, the Ducks fourth line were Brandon Duhame from the Minnesota wild and William Carrier from the Vegas golden Knights. So like briefly, I'll kind of tell you why I picked these guys. So Duhame reminds me a lot of Sam Carrick where the Ducks kind of bounced him up in the lineup in different positions whenever guys were out or they needed a spark or whatever. We saw him at the top line at times, second, third line, all over the place, and obviously majority on the fourth line, but he took over that Derek Grant role early on in the year. Eventually, Grant fell back into that role and found himself with Zegras, but he was a guy that kind of bounced up and down, and Duhame did that uh, on occasion uh, throughout the season. He played the majority of his, his ice time with Bukestad and Sturm, on the fourth line before Sturm uh, ended up getting traded. Uh, but I think he, he ended up playing the third most minutes of the lines that he was with, with Eric Sinek and Greenway when they had some injuries. So he did get bumped up. I think that was early on in the year too. So and he had a pretty good year, 17 points in 80 games as a fourth line forward. That's not too bad. 122 pims, 11 fights, same number as Carrick, one less than Nick Delorier. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll point that out. Uh, and yeah, he was, uh, you know, he, he just kind of a, a jack of all trades. Defensively, he had had some good underlying numbers when you looked at it. Not as great as Carrick, um, which concerning, I guess, on a very, you know, 
defensively solid Minnesota team. But I, I thought he looked good, and I watched a little bit of him this year. He's got some size to him. I think he's six foot two, over 200 pounds, so does provide a little bit of size on, on the back end uh, and some scrappiness. I mean, if you've got him, Carrick, and, and maybe another guy who could drop the gloves on that fourth line, but they also get things done either defensively or can drive play, then um, I think that's what, what I would be looking for as a, a fourth line forward. And that's when we get into William Carrier and the guy looks like he probably should fight, but he, he doesn't, <laughs> he's got the size to fight. He's uh six, two, like 212 pounds, I think, but still doesn't fight, but surprisingly solid offensive play driving numbers. I like got out of nowhere. When you go and look at his RAPM chart. And if you look at some of the underlying numbers on either natural stat trick or some of the other sites, he, he does drive offense on the lines that he's been on. And another guy, like Duhame, who with injuries to Patch Reddy and other wingers in Vegas kind of jumped up and down the lineup and looked really good on, on lines with, uh, I think, Marsha Show at times. And uh, I think he played the top line a little bit as well. But finished with a career-high nine goals, 20 points, and 63 games played, so not too bad. And like I said, he's got the the size to play a physical role, can move up and down the lineup, which is great. And when you think of the, the fact that he can drive play on any line he's on, you put him on maybe the left wing, of a line with, if we were lucky here, Duhame and Carrick. I think that's a really good look, uh, good look fourth line. So the, the hard pick of, of dream targets for the fourth line, those would be my guys, guys who provide just a little bit more than just being, you know, the, the typical grinder fourth line forward. <clears throat> yeah, I, it's actually funny. I, uh, I definitely went that way with that one too. I, uh, my two dream targets are uh, Nicholas Obe Kubel, uh, who plays for Colorado. And then the other guy I had is Evan Rodriguez, who spent this season, had a career breakout year uh, with Pittsburgh. Uh, and, you know, just kind of the similar thing. I, you know, Obey Kubel, uh, he was a little up and down in the year after the bubble. So the 56 game season. With Philly, was, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so he was with Philly for the bubble, and when they got into the bubble, he actually played really well. Uh, He was a a menace on the four checkies, uh, you know, banging bodies, but really just a very aggressive, fast type of forward, a real modern fourth-line player, in my opinion. Um, And, you know, he struggled in the shortened season last year, and uh, I believe he ended up on waivers, and... Colorado picked him up there and he's just kind of filled a nice little role uh, in the bottom six uh, for Colorado. And then, you know, Evan Rodriguez uh, is a guy who similar to, like you said, with Kerry, I think can move up and down the lineup. Um, you know, obviously we've seen him play the Sid and Malkin at different times and things like that. So there's certainly the understanding that you can put him higher up and it isn't maybe as, stark of a difference right he doesn't necessarily stick out like a sore thumb like some of the other fourth line guys uh have at times um but yeah you know i just wanted to get just just upside if we're going dream targets uh you know for me it was about just upside uh obi kubel is a guy who's i think he's like 24 25 right now so he's not yeah. out of the ducks window but he can be a little, little bit older and you know hopefully uh, theoretically i should say he would be a part of that you know uh, that kind of group, and he could be with the team for a while. And then, you know, Rodriguez is a guy I imagine you sign on a one-year deal and maybe move him again at the deadline or something like that if he's open to it. Uh, then the second one was low-risk targets, and I will go real quick, and I will say I had Brian Boyle and Jerry Mayhew. Um, I just think Brian Boyle is a wonderful modern uh veteran i just think he's great he's one of the most respected veterans in the league um he's a guy that everywhere they go or everywhere he goes he gets rave reviews from teammates from media from coaching staff and all that kind of stuff he's just a guy everybody really seems to like and appreciate and jerry mayhew i just really like him man i just really enjoyed the way that he kind of played uh this year uh in 15 games so who are your two low low hanging fruit as it were yeah, I, I went with just the, I guess the two easy choices here in, in the guys that are pending your face for the Ducks um, and played, well, I guess Simone and, and Ash and Reese were the picks, so you know them, but they didn't always play for the fourth line for the Ducks. But I, I could easily see a fourth line of Carrick, Simone, Ash, and Reese not having to go out and sign into anybody elsewhere, bringing these guys, keeping them in-house, 
as part of that trade and seeing what they could do. And they've both had great numbers in the past, uh, specifically defensive numbers. When you look at Ashton Reese at one point, I think it was by the Twins and Evolving Wild. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've had him as their, their under-the-radar Selkie favorite. Yeah. And uh, Simone has been a part of that discussion as well. And uh, Of course, a lot of that has to do with the way the Penguins play and the way they set up. But I did like what I saw from both of them. Again, we talk about the ability to jump up and down the lineup and, and still be an effective player. That's always nice to have in a fourth line forward. And I, and I think they could both be had for, for fairly cheap, even if it was only on a one- or a two-year deal. So I, I just had them coming back as the easy low-risk, low-cost. You know what you're getting with them. They're not going to cost a ton, mm-hmm. and you can plug them right back into the lineup. So those were my easy ones for uh, low-risk, low-cost. And <clears throat> so... Again, apologies to everybody who is listening or watching. Whatever, we're we're kind of figuring this out as we go because that's how we do it at Forever Mighty. Uh, professionalism always. Uh, but one of the things we're going to do is we kind of figured if we had any in common, we'd talk about why we had them in common and why it worked so well as a fit in whatever place it is. And then we wanted to pick one of the other's choices and kind of talk about it. And I think Simone and ZAR for me are – are the ones I would actually like to talk to you about. But real quick, why don't you give us your internal options and then your wild card options, just real quick. Yeah, so Simone and, and Zach Aston reese could easily work as internal options. Um, but I you know, I went with Sam Kerr because this was before they ended up re-signing him, and that just made sense as an internal option. He was you know, an easy option to bring back as a guy to re-sign. I was thinking at the time he was going to resign for like 1.25 or 1.5, and he ends up signing for 850k, which makes this even better. Uh, but yeah, so he, he was an easy option to to bring back for the fourth line if if he was going to play with Grant or not. Uh, and then the other option I picked was was Ben La- Ben Wilder Vigre. I'm, I'm really upset. I didn't think of one of the guys that you had on your list um, <laughs> that I you know obviously you've been a fan of, but I've been a fan of as well for a while. I he didn't even come to mind when I was writing this the, the other day. Like I don't understand how I forgot about him. But I went I went with Ben Wilder Vigre because he played 18 games with the Ducks this year and and looked pretty good. But uh, man, I can't believe I I missed out on your boy. Yeah, well, it's funny because when I saw Gru on yours, so that's I guess the other thing we should say is we have we didn't see each other's list as we were building them. Full disclosure, Eddie finished his and sent it to me a little bit before I had kind of picked all my guys, so I definitely saw his. But you know, it I I had most of my guys for most of these categories for all of them uh, done before I saw anything on Ed's, mostly because it took us three and a half weeks to get this stupid <laughs> thing done. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I grew was a guy that when I saw on yours, I was like, Oh shit, that makes perfect sense. It's a guy that, you know, we've been talking about for a couple of years now, as far as a guy that maybe can be a guy that steps in and fills that kind of bottom six defensive speedy, again, uh, a very modern fourth line player. Um, so that's what, and then who were your wild cards? Uh, wild card. This was probably the hardest of all of them to pick. Mm-hmm. It's like wild card options for for fourth line guys. Um, so I, I picked Sean Corrali, and the reason like he fell in wild card, other than like low risk or, or some of the other ones, because he makes two point five million dollars. So he's not really a low risk option or low cost option for the Ducks. He's under contract for the next couple of years, uh, but he's had a great season. Like every time I watched the um, the Blue Jackets, you know, he was noticeable. He took the second most draws on the team. It was like him and Jenner took like 600 plus draws, and the next highest guy took like 300. So they were always put in positions to to win the faceoffs, which makes sense. I mean, Jenner's one of the best faceoff um, guys in the league. Corrali was actually under 50, percent but they still kept putting him out there because I guess they don't have anybody else to win faceoffs. But he also led. Well, the other yeah, go ahead. the other thing real quick is just like that. The, that's the nature of statistics, right? Is when you have yeah. that disparate thing. And again, Columbus hasn't been the best team this year. Uh, not that we're throwing any stones in our big glass house, uh, but you know. So I, I yeah, you're 100 percent right. Like he, even if you know his his percentage at the end of the season wasn't super strong, it, it says a lot that he took such a disproportionate number of those draws. Yeah, yeah, like an important relied upon player. Um, 30 points in 77 games when he played the majority of his season, he played on three different lines. Each one was him and Eric Robinson, who is like an AHL kind of level player. And the other line mates he had were Alexander Tessier, Justin Danforth, and Igor Chinikov. Those were his other line mates for the majority of his season. He still put up 30 points in 77 games, which is pretty impressive. Uh, played on the penalty kill for the team. But, you know, the, o- the only 
reason he kind of falls down in this list again is because of the $2.5 million, which isn't an issue for the Ducks. They're not going to be up against the cap, but it is a little bit expensive for for a fourth-line forward. And he, he led the team with 240 hits. So if you want to replace that side of the game where Nick Delore, where you lost – kind of the the physicality not maybe not the necessarily the fighting and the, and the toughness that way but a guy who can throw the body around you bring in a guy who was the clear leader on that team uh in hits and then my other option was mason appleton kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum we're taking we're talking mm-hmm. about a guy who wins face-offs and plays gritty and hits appleton is kind of a guy who just does everything nothing great but he does everything pretty well you, a guy who, can, again, can jump up in the lineup. When he was in Seattle this year, he played a lot with Wenberg, played a lot with Yanni Gord, and looked really good. His points totals were a lot better, of course, in Seattle when he was playing up in the lineup versus when he went to um, Winnipeg when they claimed him off waivers and he was playing with Adam Lowry and uh, and Zach Sanford. So the numbers definitely went down. I think he only had four points in 19 games with, uh, with Winnipeg. But... Yeah, he, he's just one of those guys who can do a little bit of everything, can chip in offensively, can jump up into the top nine if you need him. He's still pretty big. He's I think he's six foot two, like one hundred ninety four pounds. So he's he's get, still got a little, little bit of decent size to him. Um, but yeah, I I just I don't know. I I liked him as an option. I, I just remember watching him early on in the season um, with Seattle, and and I really liked the way he played. And watching the first few games for Seattle, and before. Uh, the expansion draft when he was playing and kind of coming into his own and making his debut with the Winnipeg Jets. He was, again, that kind of guy who jumped up and down the lineup, and I really liked him there. So not uh, not an easy one to get. I think he's under contract or is a pending RFA. So not I, I don't think the Jets are going to want to let him go again after letting him go into expansion <laughs> and then claiming him off waivers. Right. I, I don't think that's going to happen. But he would be a, yeah, he'd be an interesting one to bring in. Yeah, I you know it's interesting that you mentioned about the the Corelli uh, the Corelli cap hit uh, being so high and talking about how uh, Anaheim has plenty of room. Uh, I think that was one of the other things that made the Sam Carrick signing so surprising is he was certainly a guy that I could see, and and maybe this actually kind of highlights the the differences right in the post Bob Murray era under Pat Verbeek is it feels like Bob Murray probably would have given him that Derek Grant contract, right? Three yep. by one and a half or something and reward him for the dedication he's shown to the franchise and all the work he put in as a captain in the AHL and then stepping up into the lineup uh, in the NHL and, and just being a really strong presence for them. Uh, so, you know, like I said, I just think that that's you know, highlights how uh, kind of different the, the uh, front office seems to be moving forward. Um, for my internal options, as you alluded to, uh, the first guy I picked was Sam Steele. Uh, and I have him, you know, again, like I've been banging this drum for, you know, a year and a half or something now. But like, I just think they need to move him to the wing. Let him be a winger full time. Yeah. Let him be a bottom six guy. Let him just focus on, uh, you know, just defense and forechecking and maybe a little bit of playmaking, right? If if you have guys, like if you are able to bring in a guy like Mason Appleton or Evan Rodriguez or somebody like that who can maybe add a little bit of offensive pop. Sam still, you know, he's shown decent playmaking ability. He's got good vision. He's a, he's a fine passer. I don't think he's necessarily a good passer, but he's not a bad passer uh, or playmaker. And the other guy I picked was Hunter Drew because apparently he's a forward now. Yeah, I'm so disappointed uh, and... I forgot about him. So <laughs> My thing for him was, you know, it, it was addressing the Nick Delorier thing. And, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense if you have a guy internally that you can bring up. You know, he has that sneaky good shot. Um, and he still has that level of, of physicality and, 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 you know, the fighting. Uh, that maybe you you want to have around a young team, and he's in the same age group as these guys, so he can grow with them. He can be part of that group moving forward, and I, I don't think that can be undersold. And then my wild cards, I absolutely chose violence, and I picked uh, Nick Delorier and Carter Rowney, uh, two guys that since they've left, I've missed very much. Um, I just think Carter Rowney's a really good fourth-line player. I just think he's exactly what you want in a fourth-line guy. He can play center. He can play wing. He's pretty quick. He's smart. He's strong. Uh, you know, he's solid defensively. He's not going to score a lot of points, but he's going to eat minutes on the penalty kill. He's going to eat minutes at five on five. You can trust him to be out there. Uh, and Nick Delorier again, like I just he think fights. in the 
in the event that you want to go out and bring uh, a fighter back in, I, I, to me, Nick Delorier makes the most sense because yeah. he's comfortable with everybody in the room. Everybody already knows him. He knows how he fits in there. Uh, and, 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 you know, again, like we've, we've seen it in Minnesota and we've seen it here where the players talk about him very positively. His, uh, his perception uh, internally and externally seem to be very different. And I'm not saying that has any different kind of value judgment or anything like that, but just more of those players really do seem to like him. So if you're going to bring somebody in like that, I think it just makes a lot of sense to get somebody that everybody likes, um, you know, and, and that's kind of it. But yeah, I want to tend to agree to with that about, <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't want to, it's not, I'm not trying to overthink it or anything. I, I definitely picked him because it was funny to me. Uh, but also just because I, I do think that if that's something you're looking for, he makes the most sense. So Dominic Simon and Zach S. and Reese, I was really curious about having them as fourth line guys because I think, you know, traditionally a lot of people would look at them as, as kind of your third line checking line forwards. Um, but like we've kind of been talking about, this is, this is a different team, um, you know, and having them as fourth line guys, I think, is a really interesting thing because, like you said, you can move them up and down the lineup. They can fill on either wing, on either side, in any line. You know, I think when the third guy is just a guy who's smart defensively, I, I don't think that's ever bad. Uh, but I think again, it, it highlights a a desire to step into a much more modern roster and a much more modern lineup. Um, you know, and just have two guys who are just good. Like, if other teams' third liners are your fourth liners, you're in a really good spot. Yep. And I think that's something that, you know, especially with what I imagine to be a fair amount of roster, roster fluctuation over the next year, having guys like that, I just think is valuable because they're consistent. They kind of play with effort. You know, they're going to be on the right side of everything uh, as far as, you know, putting defense first and, you know, if they score five goals each, great. If they don't, you don't care. That's not why you're bringing them in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, my, my whole thought process with them as fourth liners is <laughs> I looked at what positions we had to fill and I kind of thought like, all right, realistically, the the most likely scenario is Lindstrom is back and he's the the internal third line center. McTavish is with the team next year, either centering that second line or playing with who we have listed in here as Henry and Comtois. And Milano is back on that top line. So there really is no place for Simone and, and Ash and Reese. If those guys come back and the rest of the guys we have penciled that are here, they fit on the fourth line at that point. I think they are probably borderline third line players, right? Even on good teams, the Aston Reese was a, and Simone were fourth line or third line players in, in Pittsburgh, even with a deep team that they had, and they have occasionally got pushed down to the fourth line because of that. So that's why I had them there. And, and I think just the two of them with Carrick, it, you know, it gives you a kind of a nice shutdown line. I don't think you want to necessarily always throw it out against the opposing team's top players, but it does kind of give you that ability to, Throw out three guys that you're comfortable having out there. You know they're going to have a, a net positive impact um, on the pace of play with the, you know the way they've they've played defense over the last couple of years. So yeah, that was that was kind of my thought process with them. Is is just the way the roster could realistically shape out if we're taking out trades and anything like that. And the guys who are more than likely to come back or be a part of this roster next year, they just slot down on the fourth line. That's just where they go. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and like you said, um, if you have those two guys on either side of Sam Carrick, I mean, we saw it from Dad Sickens this year. He likes to play that fourth line against top lines, right? He felt like, you know, uh, the amount of effort and, and forechecking and physicality and, and veteran presence, right, I, I think it's fair to say is, is what he was looking to get out of, those times where even if it may have seemed a little bit puzzling why he was putting that fourth line out there. And um, I think I've talked about this a little bit before, but I always think back to like the Clippers, like, I don't know, probably seven or eight years ago. And it was when Doc was in full control of everything and he was making all these kind of weird personnel decisions. And they talked to a G another GM anonymously. And one of the things that he said is, he goes, the problem with having your coach be your GM is he can keep his favorites. 
And one of the things that that guy said is he would have, if he was the GM, traded some of the older guys off of that team and forced Doc Rivers to play his young guys. In a similar thought process, if your fourth line is Carrick and Aston Reese and Simone, and Dallas still wants to play his fourth line against top two, you know, the top six lines, he has to play a solid line. Yeah. You're kind of taking the the risk or uh, the downside out of him making that decision, and you're kind of forcing him into a position where he's just making a better decision, you know, or or, or the decision he's making is supported more, right? Yeah. You can look at it either way. Um, so. Yeah, so I just, I again, like I just think that's that's really smart to me, and it makes a lot of sense. And like you said, they probably don't aren't going to cost a lot of money. And uh, you know, I would be curious to know if they would prefer one year deals to three year deals. Um, you know, just because again, like if it's a one year deal, maybe they get moved at the deadline, and maybe they can go help out a contender, and you know that kind of stuff. Um, but also, it's not the worst thing in the world to know where you're going to be for a couple. So I could see it from both sides, and I'll be very curious to see what those two guys end up choosing uh, when everything kind of settles. Yeah, even if they sign uh, longer-term deals, if the term is low enough, we've seen that teams like uh, Tampa Bay and teams that get up against the cap will still take on guys with two or three years on their contract as long as the cap hit is low if they've proven that they can be impactful players. Like I could see you know, Simone and, and Ashton Reese – signing three-year deals, let's say around 1.2, 1.3, whatever, um, having some good a good season on a, a fourth line, occasionally jumping up and down the lineup with injuries, and having some interest after year one or at the deadline of year one or maybe year two when they still have a little bit of term left and teams that are willing to give up a little bit more for them because of that term means they get one, two, maybe three shots at a cup and at a ring with those guys in the roster. And, you know, Again, a lot of teams are going to look back at past history and be like, okay, well, when these guys were on a competitive team, when Aston Reese and Simone were on Pittsburgh when they were making cup runs, they were valuable players. Like, they chipped in offensively every now and then, but defensively they were very, very good players and got put out in key situations, were effective on the penalty kill, and teams will go back and look at that and be like, hey, maybe we can replicate that here. You know, they're not having the best of season in Anaheim, but that a lot of that has to do with the team, and we'll take the chance, you know, third-round pick for – two and a half years of this mm-hmm. guy right so i i, I wouldn't be opposed yeah. to it but you know one year deal the same thing you can deal them at the deadline as a rental and still get something for them so yeah and you know i think uh, the the easy comparison to make is brandon hagel right and he gets moved with term on his deal because for the lightning it's better to have that continuity it's better to have that certainty and they know exactly what they're getting out of him and it was worth the price they paid. I, I don't think either of these guys would ultimately end up uh, demanding that same kind of price because I'm pretty sure it was like two firsts or something kind of wild. Yeah. Um, but wow. I do think um, they they could provide that kind of same thing in like a bargain bin way if other GMs are trying to replicate it, which we see every year that they do. You know, they try to take – whether they take the right lessons or not, they do try to learn from the winner – the year before yeah. uh which is why barkley goudreau and blake coleman are rich men now yeah exactly. so um uh yeah so do you want to just move to 3c because i feel yeah. like we talked about the forwards Let's the fourth to, forwards pretty good move to 3c we, we both have uh, a similar one in 3c as our internal option yeah so yeah we both had isaac lindestrom as an internal option uh who was your pie in the sky your your dream pick. Yeah, my, my dream pick was Nicholas Waugh from the Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, didn't get to watch a ton of Golden Knights games this year, but when I, whenever I did or whenever they played Anaheim, he was just kind of a fun player to watch. And I think a lot of it had to do with the injuries that they had this year to a bunch of guys. There was He was playing up in the lineup and getting a lot more looks than, than he probably normally would when if you had Eichel and Carlson healthy. But obviously Eichel missed the majority of the season. And at times Carlson missed a handful of games. So Waugh sometimes was that guy who was playing with Smith, Smith and Marsha Show or Dadanov and Yanmark, like, you know, the second line, third line center role occasionally. Uh, and it worked out really, really well for him this year. 15 goals, 39 points in 78 games. That's some pretty good production for a guy, I think, didn't even put tw- up 20 points before this. I think it was like 15 points in 50-some-odd games 
the season prior to that with Vegas when he was more of a fourth line forward and then when he was drafted by Carolina he played a handful of games with them and really didn't put up much but when you look at his underlying numbers defensively and it wasn't that great I know Vegas as a whole wasn't great in, in a lot of aspects this year but was actually a pretty solid play driver and I again I know a lot of that's going to come from the fact that he did play with Dad and Yan Mark and Smith and Marsha show and, and it's clear you know, the the best production came playing with those guys, which makes sense, right? Like when you're when you're playing with Smith and Marshall Show and you're playing up in the lineup, you're playing with better players. So, you know, the, the production is gonna come with those guys. But I just I just like everything he kinda brings. He's a jack of all trades type guy. He can play the penalty kill, you can put him on a second power play unit. He's got enough offensive skill to get things done. Be he's big enough to be a net front presence. He's six foot four, two hundred and five pounds. You can stick him in front of the net and block out the sun. He's got good hand eye coordination so you can get uh, the high tip if you want to try that or the high tip from the slot. And he, he's just one of those players like the, the work ethic is there, right? With this guy like he's kind of I think he's a fourth round pick. He's had to, you know, grind it out five years in the queue, a few years in, in uh, the American Hockey League, didn't prove himself with one team, got traded to another and proved himself and and finally is getting the chances to go up in the lineup so he's a a really fun option for a team like anaheim next year who is going to still have a lot of question marks at center you know zegris is going to be back for a second full season at center we'll see how that works mctavish is presumably going to play center henrik has the option to but has played on the wing before a lundestrom should be back uh, but not like any real lock. I wouldn't look at anybody and say they're a lock to play center for the entire year. So it gives the, uh, the Ducks an option to potentially bring in a guy like this in, in, in Nicholas Waugh, play him, start him as the third line center. He's played on the wing before, so you could move him over there. And if guys like McTavish struggle or Zegers still struggles down the middle and you want to shift him to the wing, bump him up into the top six, and he's shown that he can do that and play with better players. So I, I really like him as an option. Um, and then again, just with Vegas needing to move out some cap. I don't think it mm-hmm. I don't think Waz a guy they would want to move, but you can potentially take advantage of that situation that if you revisit that and maybe you know maybe it's not Dad and all, but just as an example, because the Ducks have been around that before, a throw in for taking Dad enough's contract, plus you take I think the two point nine or whatever that Wa earns and all of a sudden you've cleared eight million dollars off their books because right. they're gonna need to clear a lot of salary, right? So uh I think it's it's potentially a guy you could ask for a throw in and uh, maybe you send back a cheaper player to kind of fill the roster for them and you get a good player like that. So I, I really like him as a as a dream potential option for the Ducks' third line. Yeah, no, I... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, no, I like that pick. I, um, you know, like you said, he's got good size. He's shown enough upside to be able to move up and down. He can play across the, the whole uh, front line. Uh, the guy I went with... Um, kind of in a similar vein for my dream pick was Jack Roslevic, who is going to be a restricted free agent uh, with Columbus this year. And I, you know, I don't think Columbus is in any kind of dire straits uh, like Vegas is with their cap space, but they're going to try to keep Patrick line. I'm sure. And he's not going to be cheap. Uh, you know, they've got that Wierenski contract. They're going to have guys that are going to start needing to get paid soon. And, I don't necessarily know if Roslovic is a guy that's going to fit into their plans. Um, you know, he he's an interesting one to me because, you know, him going to Columbus was huge because that's where he's from. You know, he's from that area. So for him to be able to kind of play in his hometown, he was very excited about it. Uh, you know, he was a throw-in in the Dubois line swap. Um, but this year he put up he put up really good numbers. I think he put up like... 23 goals, 22 goals, 23 assists, something like that. He had like 45 points. He just, yeah. real strong play. He's, you know, decent size. He's not as big as Watt. He's about 6'1", 190, but, you know, not. he's not small, right? Yeah, he he's still throws his weight around. He, he still plays a physical game, so. <clears throat> yeah, and, you know, I feel like when I've watched him, I was, I like, I looked at it, you know, I looked at his penalty minutes, and he only had like 12 penalty minutes or something ridiculous this year, and it really surprised me because I feel like when I've watched him play, he's had a little bit of bite to his game, and he's got a bit of an attitude, and I just think that's something that is going to be, I think that's going to be something to keep an eye on in Anaheim is if they kind of are able to have that, continue to have that swagger and to have that kind of chippiness and, and have guys that are going to get 
into those scrums and, you know, not necessarily to start fights or not necessarily do any of that, but just to kind of mess with other guys, your face washes, get in the way, stand a little too close to the goalie, all that kind of stuff. And I, I just think Roslovic provides an interesting opportunity. The other thing with him is is he's played wing before at times, uh, right wing. He's a right shot, which is always nice to have. And I don't think right wing is the strongest position in the Ducks organization. Um, you know, and like you said, if those three guys that you kind of, if any three of those four guys, as far as Lundstrom, McTavish, Zegris, and Henrique, uh, fill the having a guy that has played center, you can play him with a left-handed center and now has still have someone who's capable of taking draws with a right hand. Um, you know, he's a guy who's going to be strong, uh, responsible defensively, having come from the middle of the ice and things like that. I just think it makes a lot of sense. I think uh, he could be an interesting addition, and he's only like 25. Yeah. So he's not someone who, uh, you know, is kind of changing the trajectory of the team uh, uh, timeline-wise. You know, he's a guy who can fit in for five, six years on the team and just be a meaningful uh, role player. So, yeah, no, I, I really like that one a lot. I think I think he is uh, a, a nice upside pickup. And, you know, you know, again, it's going to be hard to pry him away from Columbus. But like you said, they're in a spot right now where, you know, they're going to likely commit long term to line A and they're going to have to say, OK, how much do we want to commit to this guy? We've got Kent Johnson a few years down the road. We're going to have to re-sign. We've got Cole Sillinger. We're going to have to re-sign down the road. You know, key players to their rebuild that you got to start to look at and say, okay, like, how much do we want to give this guy and for how long before it becomes a problem? And then maybe you look at uh, you look at moving him. And I think he'd be a great option. I, I like I, Right now I like any player who has some versatility to them. You know, bringing mm-hmm. in a guy who can play center and play the wing that if they – you know, if things work out and Zegers, McTavish, and Lindstrom look great, okay, well, we brought this guy in for center, but we're going to move you to the wing. And the Ducks need right wingers, specifically right shot right wingers are, are a good option. And uh, and Rozilich is a guy that, if it doesn't pan out as a third line C, he'd be a great second line winger. Like, it would yeah. not be a, a bad Absolutely. option to, to bump him up to that, that second line and play him, you know, with McTavish and Comtoir, Henry and Comtoir, whoever you want to play him with on that second line. So, He'd be a great option for that, and a second power play guy that you could really mm-hmm. boost that that second unit for. I, I like that a lot. I want to skate over my um, my low risk option because I picked Sam Steele. Um, yeah. I, I was really debating placing Mason McTavish here, but I I honestly think he could easily be the Ducks' second line center next year um, if Henry shifts to the wing. So I copped out and I and I couldn't think of anybody else, so I went for Sam Steele. Uh, I'm, that's that's all I'm gonna, gonna say about that one. Um, <laughs> my my wild card was uh, was Jake Evans from uh, Montreal. I really liked him every time I've watched him play this year. He, he's been a fun player to watch. He's played down the middle. He's played on the right. So again, kind of in the same theme we had here with Wa and with Rosalich mm-hmm. as a guy who could move to the wing. And if he is a guy that wants to play center, he's not going to get that opportunity potentially either. Maybe not, maybe next year he might, but the whole thing is like, is Shane Wright going to play in Montreal next season? I think he probably will. And then you've got Shane Wright or you got Nick Suzuki. Number one, Shane Wright. Number two, Christian Dvorak. Number three. Okay. Bam. Your three center spots. Those are locked up. Those guys are not moving. Dvorak's a guaranteed center. Suzuki's a guaranteed center. And if you're bringing right into the NHL next season, you're for sure playing him at, in the middle of the ice. You're not moving him anywhere else. So then Evans, fourth line center. Okay, well, he's played on the wing, so let's move him to the wing. Well, they have Cole Caulfield. They have Mike Hoffman. They have Josh Anderson. They have Brendan Gallagher. They have Joel Armia. They have Byron and Jonathan Duran. More that's more than the six wing spots. I think that what did, how many of the guys did I list there? I was like seven or eight guys. Seven guys. So you've got one extra there. So and if he's got to beat out two of those guys to right. get a top nine spot, okay, well, now he's on the fourth line. He just signed a three-year extension, so that's why I didn't think it'd be easy to deal him. But you might start looking at that as a guy who either asks for a trade or the team looks to move him for some for help somewhere else, whether it be on defense or in net, because who knows what's going to happen with, with Corey Price next year, or Corey Price, Carey Price next year. Uh, so he just all of a sudden could get pushed out because he doesn't have a lot of options. Guys, top prospects in front of him, guys like Cole Caulfield are going to demand spots. Guys who make a lot more money and, you know, Hoffman, Anderson, Gallagher, Armia 
are going to and Drew and they're going to demand those spots because the amount of money that they make uh, it, it's going to be tough for him to get a role. So I, I thought he was a wild card just in that sense. Is usually you're not going to trade a guy you just signed to an extension, but mm-hmm. um, he he's he's got some offensive flair to him. He's kind of a good all around player. And uh, I like him as an option. Again, center wing for the third line. You can move him up and down the lineup if you need to. Yeah, I think I, I, I think the point you made, too, about if Shane Wright hits the NHL, he needs to be in the center. And I, I think specifically for Montreal, and maybe this isn't the most logical or the most fair way to look at it, but I, I do think it's something that should be taken into consideration. They just lost the guy they thought was going to be their second-line center for a long time in Kakanyami. Yeah. And they had to watch him walk out the door for, you know, a first round pick is what they ended up getting back. But it wasn't, you know, I think they would have, if you ask them, I would have imagined they would have rather had Kok and Yemi and kept that kind of young core together and be able to, you know, kind of have those top two centers grow together. Um, you know, but his development stagnated and there was a thousand different things going on and he seems to be doing really well in Carolina right now. And he just signed an extension. So great. You can't risk that again with Shane Wright, especially after Cole Caulfield just had kind of an up and down two years and, you know, uh, you just changed leadership, at least at the top, as far as the GM. And now you've got Kent Hughes in there. So, you know, maybe you get a little bit of a fresh start. But Montreal fans, I don't necessarily think are the most patient bunch. And if they feel like Shane Wright, who, you know, they suffered through this very long, depressing season, kind of with well, we're going to get a shot at Shane Wright. So, you know what? It is what it is. And then they, they keep their spot in the lottery. They you know they finish last, and they get their guy. And, and if management bungles that, like, uh, they're going to be they're going to be out there with pitchforks, man. Like, they're not going to have a shot in hell. So yeah. moving a guy <clears throat> like Jake Evans, if Shane Wright is ready, right, to kind of step in, then it, it makes the most sense because – that Christian Dvorak extension, I think, will be a little hard to move. Mm-hmm. And obviously, they're not trading Nick Suzuki. So, who does that leave? Yeah, the Duran, uh, Duran's contract, even though it's only two years, five and a half for two with his production, that's going to be hard to move. Hoffman at what he makes, mm-hmm. hard to move. Anderson, Gallagher, Armia. Like, they're not easy contracts to move. And, you know, maybe it is you take on some salary, you take on Weber's contract or whatever. And,. The, the you know the the cost of taking on some of the these guys is they have to give up Jake Evans or you give them you know you you swap out some young guys for I, I Maxim come mm-hmm. to mind. maybe he has some interest for Montreal to right. put on the wing and and you bring in you you bring in Jake Evans is kind of a change of scenery I don't, I wouldn't want to give up Maxim come but just kind of pitching some ideas of how you could you could pitch it here and for Jake Evans it's the opportunity to step into a lineup that you have an opportunity to go into the top nine versus. Montreal where you had that this year and then all of a sudden you, know, you probably don't have that next year right so it's uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's a good option for, for both teams but it would be an int- it'd be a tough one to get to, to work I think it, it's with the contract extension and um, you know how well he's looked at Montreal I'm sure they don't want to move him no 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 um, you know again especially because he's a guy that kind of came up through their system and I, I just think when you're a team that's fighting the perception that you've been bungling prospects, having guys that you can kind of hold on to and look at them and be like, these are our guys. These are the guys we're bringing along and we're making progress with. Um, is huge, especially when it's a, a guy who's like a center and stuff. You know what I mean? Like it's been for four years, they've been trading for every winger in the league, trying to find a number one center. You know, they traded for Domi and moved him to the center. They traded for Drew and moved him to center. Like, uh, if Kerry if Kerry Price is healthy next year, I you can't convince me he won't at least play a game in center. Like it, it's ridiculous up there. <laughs> and fortunately enough for them, they kind of have all the time in the world to figure it out to whatever extent. So you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Shane Wright played 15 games and went back down. Um, you know, uh, and in which case, yeah, maybe they wanted to keep you know they want to keep Jake Evans there because that gives them their depth and stuff like that. But you know, again, like you said, they're up against it. They're like ten million. They're like, like over the cap already. Yeah, they have for the most, the highest cap rate of every any team in the league right now. And, and it's it's absolutely wild. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, yeah, who do you have for low risk and wild? Risk? My low risk. My low risk was Victor Rask. Um, he's such a weird player to me. 
because, you know, he was in the, uh, what was it, the Elias Lindholm trade, where yep. he ended up going the other direction to uh, Carolina, and then Carolina traded him to Minnesota. And in Minnesota, he was just kind of a guy with a contract that didn't really do a lot for them. And, you know, you look at some of his underlying numbers and stuff, and he seems to be a, a capable defensive center. And it just doesn't seem like the offensive upside is there. But again, it doesn't necessarily have to be, especially for a team like Anaheim, uh, who, who's rebuilding and is going to be going through some bumps and bruises. It, it might not be the worst thing to have guys who are a little bit more responsible defensively, even if, you know, Maybe they don't hit 10, 12 goals even in, over the course of the year, just having guys that you can put on the power play, stuff like that. And again, depending on the kind of contract you sign them to, you could be able to move a guy like Victor Rask uh, down the line at the deadline to a team looking to add forward depth for a stretch run. Um, you know, I, I think that the C, the, the third center part of it kind of to me is is kind of exactly that, right? It's either a guy that you can move on from easy or a guy that you could see growing in the next two to three years to being a bigger part of this team moving forward. Um, and my wild card was McTavish for all of the reasons that you said. My thing with McTavish is I think he's going to make the team next year. Uh, if they, you know, he, he came in as a wing, but I think especially given you know, Zegris's physical profile, I do think they're going to want to keep McTavish at center and have a more physical center presence uh, that they can play out there. And, you know, he's, he's got that insane shot. And, uh, you know, there, it is very easy for me to talk myself into him making the team next year. And at that point, if it's Zegris, you know, McTavish, Lundstrom, like you said, maybe he is that second line guy. But I also think if it's McTavish and Lundstrom, I think they're both the second line guy, and I think they're both the third line guy. Yeah. And at that point, it's just kind of you know vibes or matchups or feel. And if that's the case, that's huge. You know, maybe it allows you to move Henrik to the wing again, right? If you have like a Henrik McTavish X right line, you're in a really good spot. Um, you know, because again, we we you know I've I've been hard on Henrik, but he has been a very consistent presence uh, for Anaheim just as far as kind of being there and being relatively steady, even when the production wasn't there and he was getting scratched and waved and all that stuff. Uh, he He's not a guy you doubt the effort, you doubt the commitment, none of that stuff. He's just a guy that he's on a big contract and whatever. We're not talking about Adam Henry. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying. I think it's, you know, because he can move to the wing, if you are trying to develop McTavish to be a top two center, which it, they clearly seem to think that he can be. Uh, it, it makes sense to have a guy like Henrik on his wing and let him develop, you know, into that kind of center and take on big responsibilities and big moments. So I, I just think I expect him to make the team. I don't know how ready he's going to be. And to me, that is ultimately the question is, does he play 30, 35 games on the wing to start, or does he step in and he's, you know, a middle six center right off the bat? Yeah. And he's pushing for the colder. So that's that's a tough spot with McTavish and Zellweger, both of them right now, is they are clearly <clears throat> both way too good for junior hockey. Now I I think McTavish is physically a bit more ready for the NHL and he's easier to project that he'd be ready next year. But you know, both of them, you know, Zellweger best defenseman in all of junior hockey in Canada. The best defenseman, uh, you know, points-wise, defensively, he was great. Like, he is the CHL's top defenseman. McTavish, if he had a full season with Hamilton, probably would have been up there as a top forward in the entire Canadian Hockey League. So there is nothing left to prove but yeah, in, in junior hockey, but there's no middle ground. They, they cannot right. go to the American Hockey League. So it's like they're either on the roster or they're back in junior. So it's going to be a tough spot, but I think, for both of them. I, I really do think McTavish makes it. I think Zellweger is going to get a shot, but we'll we'll obviously get into him a little bit later. Um, our our identical pick for the internal option was obviously Isaac Lindstrom. I, I don't know mm -hmm. if you have anything specifically you wanted to mention with him. Like I, I didn't have much else to say other than he was kind of the obvious choice, right, in mm -hmm. that he had the better year between him and Sam Steele. 
he had that role kind of locked in for the majority of the season. Like that was his spot. Uh, I can't imagine, you know, barring either him getting moved or somebody else coming in that he doesn't get that again. That, that was essentially why I picked him for that spot. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree with that. I think, you know, uh, you know, when he came into the league or when he was drafted, you know, there were questions about a little bit about his size and his ability to play down the center and whether or not he was going to have to move to wing. And when he played his first few games in, in the pros, he was on the wing. And, you know, there was going to be, okay, what kind of Swiss Army knife kind of utility guy can he be? And... You know, whatever happened this year, is it sustainable? Is it not? You know, four shorthanded goals. How you know how repeatable is that? I don't know. But he's clearly going to get the opportunities on the penalty kill. So you know, maybe you're looking at that as being a positive that he is able to generate on the rush as a you know in a counter attack. Um, but I just think with Sam Steele's development kind of stagnating, he really just took that second young center you know, place by the, you know, kind of just kind of grabbed it and he ran with it and he seems to be it. And I know some of his underlying numbers aren't the best. And, you know, I think he still needs to improve in the faceoff circle, and, but he's young. And I think at this point, he's a guy that you can trust to develop. And even if he's, you know, not necessarily a guy with the kind of offensive upside that he flashed, he doesn't necessarily need to be if he's on the third line and he's being more of a checking guy, you know, mm-hmm. uh, both mockingly and sincerely, he was referred to as a, a, the next Sammy Paulson uh, for Anaheim this year. And, you know, I think if that's what he ends up with, I think everybody goes home happy. So, yeah. All right. My, we're getting into the, this is my favorite <clears throat> territory here. Uh, second line right wing. And then obviously eventually first line left wing. We got some interesting names in here. We both had uh, identical pick for internal with mm-hmm. Jacob Perot. Uh We might as well start there and get, uh, get our internal options uh, out of the way. I, I think, actually, you know what? You go. You go first. Why Why? Why, why for you was Perot kind of the <clears throat> internal option? So, you know, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier when we were talking about uh, Appleton and, and uh, Roslevic and, and Waz. The right side depth for Anaheim right now is not particularly strong in the prospects. Um especially in, in, in an immediate sense, right? I still, you know, I still think Sam Colangelo can be an NHL player and be useful and impactful. You know, he's got a big body, he's got the heavy shot and all that stuff. But the fact that I haven't heard his name in the last 18 months, really, to me, says he's still got a little bit of developing to go. And as we know from Pat Verbeek's comments, he wants these guys to dominate at the lower levels before he brings them up. He doesn't want to rush anybody necessarily, and he wants them to to really become the best version of themselves at whatever level they're at before moving up again. So I don't know, you know, I guess other than Sasha Pastyov, I don't think there's anybody besides Perot who has the combination of opportunity and ability to kind of fill that role. You know, he's, he's a trigger man. He's going to be a guy that they're going to expect to score goals, to be a sniper, Um, you know, and, you know, I, I, you know, he he took a big jump in the AHL this year, uh, as far as his production, and you know he came up for Anaheim and he looked okay. He didn't, you know, he looked a little bit overwhelmed at times, but that is what it is. The team was very good, so it can't have been easy to step into as a young guy. Um, so you know, I just think he, like, you know, kind of in a similar position to Lundstrom. I I don't know that there is another internal option besides Perot for that spot. Um, you know, especially in a top six spot, you know, Perot clearly has the, the talent to be a top six player. Yeah. I, I, I think the only other person internally I considered was Milano, but he, mm-hmm. he comes up later on, um, just because of the chemistry he has with the two guys that at the top of the, the, the ducks lineup right now. But yeah, other than that, like when we look at, Guys who aren't in the lineup, guys who are pending your face, pending our face, guys in San Diego prospects. The next in line, the guy at the top of that list is Jacob Perot, right? Like he's the top prospect down in San Diego. Like you said, had the breakout campaign after not, I guess, struggling, but adjusting to pro hockey in his, in his first season. Uh, was one of the girls' best players offensively. Was hot and cold throughout the year. Had some really good stretches, had some not so great stretches. But 
the next logical step for him is to get more than one game this year with the Ducks, right? Is is to get 20, 25 games, something like that, or you know, God forbid he has you know, a breakout season in the NHL and can stick around for 60, 70 games, who knows? But that's the next step for him is to get, you know, 10, 15, 20 games this year. And um, if you're going to pick anybody internally to take over that role, he's the guy. And he's kind of what the Ducks need right now is another pure shooter, a guy who can score from anywhere, a guy you can put on the power play in that trigger spot and, and be a, a weapon to play with you know, a Zegris or a Terry, even on the second unit to be that trigger man on the second unit because the Ducks power play near the end of the year looked nothing like the beginning of the year. And even when they first started, they didn't just have one unit who got it done. They were a two-unit power play. They had, you know, guys contributing on both sides. So it isn't like, you know, what you see maybe in Colorado or Tampa Bay where that one unit is out there, you know, Toronto, that unit's out there for a minute 30, a minute 40. You're on the second unit, you're going to get opportunities. So I could see him slotting in and in a really good secondary role for the Ducks and getting things done. Uh, I'm still excited about him. I think I think he's got a lot of potential, and you pair him with, you know, a Henrik or a McTavish down the middle. Uh, I, I think you've got uh, a recipe for success for him to do well. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, again, like, I just think he, he makes the most sense on a number of different levels for that spot. Um, so, oh, man, I, you have some really fun ones here. I really like the ones you picked. So, uh, I want to save your low risk one for the end, okay. so, not even just because I kind of like where we both went. Uh, so who was your wild card? Uh, my wild card option was Connor Garland. So I've I've been a fan of Connor Garland for the last yeah. couple of seasons uh, since he was with Arizona. Uh, just a really fun player to watch. Uh, the way he's his story to kind of get to the NHL was was fun. Um, you know, really hard worker. Put up some some uh, impressive numbers in in the QMJHL in his final few seasons, and then broke out in the scene with the Coyotes. And, and I and I think you know, there's a lot of people criticizing the trade um, to Vancouver, and he hasn't really fit that well. But I think I think he was fine this year for Vancouver. Like them as a team, up until Bruce Boudreau got there, were not they were disjointed. They weren't great. Things weren't going well for anybody. And I thought, obviously, when Bruce came in and studied the ship, everybody looked better. And I thought Connor Garland really picked his game up. And you know, he still set a career high in points, 43 points in 70 games. That's about a 50 point pace. That's second level or second line level production. And you think you, you, mm-hmm. you know, potentially pair him again. We talked about Henrik and McTavish uh, and pair him as kind of the shooter or the play driver on that line. I think he is a really good option. And, and, and one of the reasons he falls in here is because Vancouver is in that weird spot this year that they have a lot of guys they need to resign. I think Pedersen needs a new contract. Besser needs a new contract. They've got some extensions kicking in. They have some bad deals that they're trying to move on from. And Oliver Ekman Larson, they're already trying to trade him and get rid of him. Um, yep. So they're they're in a lot of salary cap trouble. And they're a team who wants to be competitive next year. I think they look at what Bruce Boudreau was able to do in the 50, 60 games that he had. And he won 32 games or something like that. They feel in this week division where the Kings made the playoffs that – they can be that team next year and they could get in and, and make a run. I think they have the talent to do it. And if you, you know, Garland might end up being the guy who's surplus to requirements to keep Besser, to keep Patterson, to keep, you know, you know, JT Miller and not have to trade him. He's been rumored to go. I don't think you want to trade a guy who put up 99 points for you and you, and you weren't even a playoff team. So if yeah. you're going to pick anybody out of those four, as great as Connor Garland in, he's probably the guy that, that ends up going out the door and saving you about, I think, 4.95 or, or whatever he mm-hmm. makes. So, yeah. and, and if you're Anaheim, I think he's the guy that uh, that you look at uh, that contract and say, listen, like this is going to be great for us. You know, whether it works out or not, it's, it, it's not a hard one to move. It's got some term on it. He had a good season, and he's a guy we can give right into a top six uh, a mm-hmm. top six role on this team, potentially even play him on the first line if you really wanted to with Zegers and, and Terry and see what he could do there. I think he's a, a good fit. So, yeah, I have I mean, I've always been a fan of Connor Garland. It's a little bit of bias here, but uh, I think there's there's an interesting situation that could develop that he potentially could find his way out the door. And he's been in trade rumors uh, since the deadline as well just because of the cap situation in Vancouver. Yeah, so I'm just looking at it right now, and 
Pedersen has two more years at seven three five, but still, in two years you're going to have to resign him, yeah. and that's going to be starting with a ten at least. Um, you know, so yeah, having a guy that you know maybe you do view as surplus to requirements, uh, you know, and and again, like you said, I don't think you want to move on from Besser, who is just such a good goal scorer that it, yeah. it, it doesn't make sense to move on from him if you can avoid it. So a guy like Garland, even if you did just bring him in, makes a lot of sense to move. And obviously we know that they're they're trying to do it. Um, my wild card was Troy Terry. Um, and this to me kind of ties into the internal option. If Jacob Perot can take a leap and really step into being a solid rookie next year, I think he should be on the first line because then you're putting him with uh, Trevor Zegras, who can help set him up, right? Yeah. We have this right-handed trigger man. We've got this left-handed center playmaker. Put them together, right? You know, and, and, and Troy Terry, then you move him down to the second line, and now you've got... Um, a little bit more balance in your lineup. And I think he showed this year that he can be a line driver on his own. Yeah. And I think he has earned the opportunity to do that. Um, if there is somebody else who can step into that first line role. So for me, you know, Jacob Perot as the second as an internal option is kind of a little bit of a cheat with Troy Terry and stuff, just because, um, you know, I think if he is ready, he probably ends up on the first line and Troy Terry ends up on the second line. But at the end of the day, if you ask them, right, who's our first line right wing, it's going to be Troy Terry yeah. until somebody else clearly makes it them or it becomes a lot closer. And now you're like, we have a top six and that's what we're doing. Um, you know, I would love to see a full season of Terry and Zegers. I think it'd be a blast. Uh, you know, they, they're creative, they're dynamic, they're, they showed some chemistry at the end of the year. Like, I, I get it. I love it. There's nothing not to like there. But if you can separate those guys, I do think it, it gives you more balance uh, as a team and a lineup going forward. So yeah. he was my wild card. It was a little bit of a cheat, but I, I just think it, it makes a lot of sense if he can drive his own line. And again, if you can just drop McTavish into that Getzloff spot where now you've got Henrik, Terry, and McTavish, we saw Henrik and Terry played really well together. They can bolt, they played really well together and they can insulate, I think, uh, a guy like McTavish a little bit better and help him kind of be able to find his footing at the pro level. So yeah. I think there's a lot to like about Troy Terry, at least as a second line right wing. Yeah, I, I really um, like it too. And, and honestly, like you, like again, you can be the, the team's best right winger and play on the second line. Like it doesn't mean just because mm -hmm. you're not on the first line, you're not that. I really like that as an option to help Mason McTavish. Uh, develop as a center at the NHL level. It would be his first games as a center at the in the National Hockey League level. This would be his tenth. His first game of this upcoming season will be his tenth game as a pro. So to shove him into second line center and say, "Here's Comtois and Silverberg or whoever, you know, go make things happen." That's tough. And and I think Zegers and and Terry are the two best play drivers on this team. And to have that balance, like you said, of two guys on each line who can drive the play. You've got Zegers driving the play and being the playmaker on the top line, and you put him now with the guy we know can shoot the puck from anywhere in, in mm -hmm. Perot, and then maybe you you put a Comtois on that line to have kind of the physical uh, guy who drives to the net or a Jones on that line. So you've got, again, the guy who's going to have a stick on his ice and be open at the back door, and the guy who can shoot it from anywhere, and then Zegers in the playmaker who can make things happen. And then you've got that second line again where then Terry takes over that Zegers role and becomes the playmaker and the play driver and the guy who sets everybody up. McTavish is the guy who's got the shot and can shoot from everywhere. And Henrique is kind of the guy who just fills in the space. And, and you've got two, two of the best defensive forwards on the team to kind of insulate McTavish in the middle. So, you know, the responsibility of being a center is still there, but you've not got, you don't have two guys who are going to fly up the ice and you're going to be screwed if you're out of position. You've right. got two guys who are defensively responsible and are going to cover up for that, the, the odd mistake from a, you know, 20 year old kid every now and then. Um, so I like that a lot. I, I really do. Uh, like, I, I saw Troy Terry here and I was curious to see 
what your explanation was from that. I really like that as an option is to, to help out Mason McTavish and spread out that, that depth. So you're not overloading that top line where you get in a game where Zegris and Terry get shut down by whoever and you've got nothing else. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, you know, again, for me, I understood why people were frustrated that it took so long in the season to put them together. But I really do think it ultimately ended up being beneficial for both of their development that they played a part. And they had both really kind of come into their own. Uh, you know, I don't I don't want to say that they're fully formed or anything like that, but they were just much stronger, much more confident players at the end of that season. And I think that is why when they did come together, it worked so well is because they were already comfortable at the NHL level. And then on top of that, now you've got this other guy who you have great chemistry with. He's going to do a lot of the things you're both pass shoot guys, um, you know, and, and so it just made a lot, it, it made a lot of sense playing them together. But I do think having them separate gives you an opportunity that um, I, I don't think is easy to find. Uh, you know, I, I think having a legitimate second line winger and, if you're Anaheim, like the last legit second line winger, top six winger that didn't play with Getzloff was Bobby Ryan, and he spent half his time with them anyways. Yeah, you know what I mean. They've been trying to find that guy for push him to the left know, five <laughs> six years. Yeah, for real. So yeah. you know, I, I I just think for me, and then the thing I I think is hilarious here is that our pie in the sky is a country rival an international rivalry and then our low option is an international rivalry uh i will say just to get this out of the way my pie in the sky was william nylander uh william nylander sorry um and so many really people sad. are gonna be mad at the way you pronounce that <laughs> i know and i actually do feel bad about that I, I didn't mean to say nylander that's so stupid uh william nylander um you know again we started this kind of before the playoffs and we're getting around to doing it now and stuff but for me like i said i think if 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 Toronto goes out in the first round, they're going to have an existential crisis. And if you are Anaheim, you should be looking to take advantage of that. Um, you know, and so for me, William William Nylander, he's my Kevin Fiala. He's my Philip Forsberg. He's the guy that's a little too old for the core that you have now. And he's going to cost you a good chunk of money, especially Nylander, who's going to be up for an extension in two years. Uh, or, or up for a new contract in two years, an extension in one. But I, I can talk myself into it. He's just so good. I, I I just think he is so remarkably underappreciated in Toronto somehow, despite the fact that he's clearly, you know, at worst their third best forward. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, he's just really remarkable. And I think they're not going to move Marner and they're not going to move Matthews. And Tavares has the full no move. It's unmovable, yeah. It's the only guy you have left. So if you're looking to make a big swing, you know, again, similar to the thing, like I said, as far as it doesn't necessarily make time time wise, does a Mrazic and Nylander for Comtuan Gibson trade make the most sense for the Ducks? Not necessarily, but you're getting a fucking a legitimate top line right winger. When you already have that, now you've got two legitimate top six wingers. And, I mean, if you want to play Nylander up with Zegers or you want to keep Terry up there, you've got another guy now who can anchor that second line and and give you that same dynamic that moving Terry down gives you. So, again, like I said, it it is full of holes uh, practically. Um, philosophically, you know, kind of with how you want the the team to be built and things like that. But he's the guy for me that if it was going to be stupid, I would be, that was the guy I would be stupid for. I just really like him. And I just think he's really good. And he's surprisingly physical, uh, you know, for a player of that skill. So for me, he's a big one. Um, Who, by the way, did you pick for your pie in the sky, Edward? Yeah, I, I, I do. I actually like the Nylander pick better than the guy I picked. Um, and and I'm a, a little bit upset I didn't think of Fial at the time, but I I picked Patrick Line and I I still stick with it and and I like that we've now discussed Troy Terry as a second line right winger because now I put a little bit more validity into bringing in Patrick Line and bringing him into play with Trevor Zegras and bumping Troy Terry down to drive a line on his own. Um, it's a tough one. Like it is it is probably the stretch the most. The, the biggest stretch of any of the picks I made, even the top line left wing 
dream target mm-hmm. that we'll get to. Like it's just a bit of a stretch because Columbus is not doesn't have any cap issues. Line A seems to be comfortable there. They've done everything they can to keep him there, including when I think it was his father who passed away. Like they gave him as much time as he needed off. Like they've done everything to make sure this this guy would want to stay and feel felt comfortable in the organization. He's had a good year, fifty six points in in fifty six games, on pace for thirty eight goals, which is still a, a remarkable season for any goal scorer. Um, and he's going to continue to get help in that team. So the future is bright there. But if there was ever a scenario where he did not want to stay in Columbus and did not want to spend the next, you know, he's got to sign a contract, right? So that's the, the thing. Mm-hmm. Does he want to sign seven or eight years in Columbus and commit himself to that, to that team? That's the big question here and what they're going to, mm-hmm. they're going to get into a discussion here. And if he doesn't, you can then swoop in and maybe it's a trade for his rights. Maybe it's an, you know, most likely an offer sheet is going to get accepted. So an offer sheet is pretty much a, a stretch at this point um, or get matched. I mean, but I, I really like the fit again of a pure goal scorer to go with Trevor Zegras on that top line. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Patrick line is one of the best shooters in the entire national hockey league. Um, it, it's amazing to me that over the last couple of years, you would have said Patrick Laine was the best shooter from that draft class, but Austin Matthews has easily surpassed him. <laughs> it's, it's nowhere nowhere close any, anymore. But Laine does have a, an exceptional shot. He does get himself in the right positions, and I think he would really benefit from playing with uh, a player like Trevor Zegers. And again, it allows you to slot Troy Terry down and become the playmaker and play driver on that second line. So you've got you know some balance and some good fit there as the center playmaker sniper winger on the top line and the playmaking winger and some of the you know the sniper center and the bigger guys in, in the middle of the ice down in the second line so a couple different looks so yeah i i i uh, i'm not gonna lie to you i i think that you overstated the gap in shooting ability between him and matthews i don't think it's that far apart i think matthews is just a phenomenally better player yeah in a complete sense and that one um, just allows him to be more effective overall, right? Whereas with Line, if he's not scoring, he's not giving you a lot, which was side of has been some of the issues that he's run into with management and coach Winnipeg and with Columbus, you know, is why can't I think of his name? Paul Maurice, you know, moved him down in the line. He's like, you're not scoring, you know, but to, and then now you get into a thing where it's like, well, you moved him away from some of your playmakers. So now what he's supposed to do is like, well, he's got to start scoring goals. And so now you have this whole like fucking Jeff Skinner situation. Um, but that being said, I think he's a, a, a remarkable goal scorer. Um, and, and I don't think even with this offensive explosion and even being excited about Terry and being excited about Perot and, you know, maybe if you want to get ahead of yourself, especially with Pastyoff, there isn't a guy on the team or in the organization that I would say had a legit shot at 50 goals every year. Patrick Line is that guy. He's that good. He, he can score from fucking anywhere. He's got an incredibly quick release. He shoots incredibly fast. Like he's got a hard shot. He's got an accurate shot. He can, he is one of the very few guys in this league who can beat a goalie from a standstill. He's the closest, like nobody's ever going to touch Ovi, but he's the closest carbon copy to Ovechkin in terms of play style and the way he looks on the ice than anybody in the Mm -hmm. league. Yeah, 100%. And and so for me, like I love Patrick Laine. You know, part of me uh, loves the... um, the similarity, I guess, is the best word I can think of right now, of you know, trading for another Finnish goal scorer to kind of help boost this young, talented core that you're putting together. Would have been um, so much better if he was still in Winnipeg, too. Yeah, it really would be. <laughs> but, you know, Columbus is the Winnipeg of the States. Yeah. It's fine. Um, that, <laughs> that was one of my favorite dumb jokes that we saw after that trade was like, Pascal, uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois wanted out of Columbus and Patrick Laine got wanted out of Winnipeg and Patrick Laine went to the Winnipeg of the States and yeah. <laughs> Dubois went to the uh, Columbus of Canada. Yeah, the Columbus of Canada. <laughs> I always thought, but yeah, I, I mean, look, it's a great pick. There's a reason that Ducks fans have been talking about this guy fucking since he came in the league. Yeah. It is very easy to see what he's good at and the value that it has. And, you know, uh, I think back to a guy like Sprong, right, who had, had an incredible shot, was had the ability maybe to be a good goal scorer, but his upside was never as high 
as Line A, who we just mentioned in the same sentence, roughly, as the greatest goal scorer of all time. Yeah. Maybe the most talented goal scorer of all time. Daniel Sprong's never that fucking guy. And my thing with him was always, if you're not going to do anything else, you need to be 40 goals. Patrick Line is 40 goals. Like, so even if you have to grit your teeth and watch him skate slower than molasses on a back check, he's going to put goals up. And, you know, you, you, you look at your coach, you look at your, your GM and you go, this is the guy we need you to work with. Right. You know, and, and, you know, Verbeek has made a lot of comments about compete. And so maybe, you know, his view on line A is a little different than ours, but I just think line A is a great choice uh, just for raw goal scoring ability. I just don't think there's anybody like him. Yeah. I, I, I really think he's rounded out. His, available. Yeah. I think he's rounded out his game too. The playmaking side of his game, uh, over the last two seasons has been a lot better. Like when mm-hmm. he came in, the first three seasons in uh, in Winnipeg, he was like, I'm going to score goals. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to play defense. I'm not going to really pass the puck. I'm going to be a straight like 40 goal, 20 assist guy. Like that is that is it. Mm-hmm. And he's rounded at the game. Like again, closer to a point per game player in his last season in Winnipeg, 63 points in 68 games, more assists than goals, but still on pace for around 40 goals. Same thing this year in Columbus, 26 goals in 56 games, right around that 40 goal pace, 38. But you know this guy is going to get hot at some point and go on a stretch where he scores six in six or seven in seven and get to, get to 40, right? Uh, but again, on pace for 82 points. To have around 45, 50 assists and be that complete player. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, like Philip Forsberg or somebody like that who's going to put up 40 goals and 40 or 50 assists and can kind of do a little bit of everything. At six foot five, he's starting to throw his body around a little bit more and be a physical presence and not the gentle giant, you know, again, more of an Ovi type. I don't want, I, I hate comparing anybody to Ovechkin because nobody's Ovechkin. But again, like right. at six foot five and a pure sniper, that's who you're going to get compared to. But he's starting to kind of round out the areas of his game and mm-hmm. become a more complete player. And the goal scoring has not sacrificed because of right. that. it's still there. Like that shot is still there. <laughs> and that's what makes, you know, the future for Line A in the next couple of years very scary for a lot of for a lot of teams. Other you know, whoever the team he's with, it's exciting. Anybody else, it's it's scary because there are not gonna be many guys who can do what they do he does at that size. Uh, and it's it's going to be very, very hard to handle him when he fully kind of comes into his own. So whoever ends up getting him is, is going to have one of the best goal scorers of the next generation on their hands. So he's never going to get to the the OV area. But there's not, some, there's not a lot of players in this league who you could bank on and say, this guy is going to score me 35, 40, 45 goals every single year. No question. I'm not even worried about it unless he gets injured. Yeah, I mean, he walks into the locker room as a Rocket Richard candidate from day one. Mm-hmm. There just aren't a lot of those guys, you know. And even with this boom that we've seen this year in goal scoring and, and offensive production from elite players especially, there just aren't a lot of guys. You know, there are guys that have the talent maybe or the ability that you're like, if they have a great season, like an nth, pretend, an nth percentile season, and they peak for a season, just completely redline. Maybe they can win us a rocket shard. He doesn't have to peak. He can just be him, put up 45 to 50 goals in a season potentially. And you're just kind of like, yeah, that looks about right. That's kind of what we expect from him. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, like in this you know, offensive I, boon of a season, only five guys hit fi- or four guys hit 50. So Ovechkin mm-hmm. had 50, Kreider had 52, Dry at 55, Ovi had 60. Uh, and only. A bunch of guys had 40, so 14 guys or 13 guys had 40. But still, like, again, in, a, in yeah. the most oh. historic offensive season in NHL history, only four players got 50 goals. And I think if Line had a full season and had a little bit better support of mm-hmm. players to play with, he would be right up there. I feel like it would be him. It would be Matthews, Drysdale, and him every year as mm-hmm. the guys yes. who are going to challenge for the next five 10 years for the rock Richard, unless obviously somebody else comes into the league when we're talking about some of the young players coming up. But right now, every year, those would be the guys I would pencil in as my one, two, three. Uh, if Lina had a bit more help as guys, I could shoe in for, for 45, 50. Yeah. And here's the other thing that I think is very easy to forget with Patrick Lina. He turned 24 a month ago. Mm-hmm. So he will be 24 for all of next year. Yeah. And, that's fucking insane. 
Like, that's just absolutely insane. So, uh, okay, real quick, I feel like it's easy to just kind of hit this real quick and then we'll move on to yours. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know that anybody didn't think this was coming. I picked Phil Kessel. If you're asking me for my low-risk, low-cost, you know, goal-scoring right wing. It's always been Phil. I want Phil Kessel. Every year. All year it's been Phil. (laughs) Just bring, like, you know, and I I actually don't know if we said this, but, like, we did do a write-up that we've been kind of, you know, all that stuff, and it's going to go out when we put this out, and so you guys can kind of look at them and yeah. get a little bit more in depth. We strategically you told you thoughts. an hour and thirty into the podcast that we're doing a write up, so you didn't turn it off. <laughs> exactly, we're very smart. We're actually geniuses. Uh, but uh, you know, I, it's for me. It's just don't overthink it. Anaheim is going to need goals. He can score goals. They're going to need a guy to fill spots on the power play. He can do that. I I know it was reported. I think. Um, Friedman talked about it on 32 thoughts where he was saying some of the contending teams didn't want to trade for him at the deadline because they were concerned uh, about his Ironman streak and about being in the position that Philly found themselves in with Yandel where, you know, you face a significant amount of backlash because you sat a guy for a game and, you know, mess with the streak and stuff and contenders didn't want to deal with that, which I understand. I don't, you know, I think that's fair. Um, And I'm not going to have that problem. There's nobody, you know, that should take that spot from him as a top six forward. So, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, the goals, the the best thing that happens is he keeps the streak up, Um, you know, and he's able to kind of find his way. His goal scoring really dropped this year, but again, he was playing for Arizona. They're fucking garbage. Um, And so for me, I just, I, I just think it makes a lot of sense. I don't think it needs too much more explanation than I've already over explained. Uh, But I just, I just want to give you the floor, Edward. Yeah. What is what is your choice? Talk to us, brother. My low risk, low cost option for a second line right wing for the Ducks next year is none other than Corey Perry. And I know a lot of you are going to <laughs> get, get upset with that. Uh, my whole thought process is I have watched Corey Perry in interview after interview over the last couple of years. Ball, he almost ball his eyes out at the thought of not being in Anaheim anymore. And what a better way to ride off into the sunset than win a Stanley Cup in Tampa Bay this year after being runner up for the last two years and pulling a Marion Hosa. Is Marion Hosa run? Win the Stanley Cup this year with the Lightning. Come back for Anaheim the last year of your $1 million contract and retire. A year after gets left with the C, yeah, with the with yeah, the hundred percent. If yeah, he shows 100%. up, it's his. Yeah. Now the 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 wrench in this is Perry had an excellent year with the Lightning this year. He had forty points and nineteen goals in eighty two games. Um, now again, he was he did great in Dallas and in uh, Montreal as well. Twenty one points in both those seasons, fifty seven and forty nine games. It hasn't been a problem for him. The the only bad season he's had in the last in his entire career essentially was the 10 points in 31 games in his final season in Anaheim. That was it. Right. That was the last bad season he had cuz before that he had 49 points and 17 goals in 71 games, which again he was making 8 million at the time, so that was considered right. not great uh in Anaheim, but he's still a great player. That's the thing. And again, he got that of uh, the time that he left in the re, you know, he, he he was on the downturn from what the expectation was from him as a right. franchise eight and eight and a half or whatever he was making million dollar player. Well, meanwhile, Getzlaff was still doing that uh, for the Ducks. So I'm, I'm not going to go back and cr- criticize, um, you know, that, that side of things. But again, I think he could be a valuable player in the top six. He's putting up those numbers in a stack Tampa team in their bottom six, occasionally jumping up and down the lineup playoffs right now four goals and assists five points in nine games one of the you know the leading goal scorers for uh Tampa Bay Lightning playing on the power play right now as well with some injuries he I had just, a goal tonight yeah he had a goal tonight on the power play the first goal of the game um again like listen he's not the flashy option the line a the knee lander that you know he's not the the young option that is going to get better as things go on you know as time goes on he's not the smartest option but if you want to have a feel good option. Bring in a guy who can play yeah. up and down the lineup. You know he's not going to take a spot from the kids. You can 
put him on the fourth line. You can put him on the third line. Put him on the second line, the first line, whatever. He's gonna jump. He's gonna play anywhere. He's gonna be great in the locker room. He gets to come home for the final season, probably of his career after winning a cup. Hopefully, uh, I don't really want the three peat, but I would want it for Perry. And uh, and then he retires as the captain one year after Ryan gets left. So it's my my feel good story to to bring. Yeah, back. I mean, um. We'll get into this in a second, but like, if you told me going into next year that the top line was Milano, Zegers, Perry, fuck yeah, dude, let's go. I don't care. Yeah. I just, just don't. Because again, like, does he score twenty I, goals I, playing with Zegers in his final season? I think he does. I think he does, especially being back in Anaheim. I think he does. Um, you know, and again, like you said, he had a really good year this year, and it is in a stacked team, but he's playing with Patrick Maroon and Pierre Edward Bellamar. Like, that's who his line mates were for a significant part of this year. And he's played up a little bit to try to, you know, give some scoring punch at times to the Sorelli line and things like that. Um, but I just, yeah, man, I, there's nothing about it not to love. I just think it's great. I am 100% in on you, uh, on this with you. And for me, uh, you hit on something that's kind of funny, which is the three P. And if he finally gets that, you know, as part of this three P after coming up short to that same team for two years in a row and can't beat him, join him, and you do it, it actually prevents presents an interesting opportunity, which is after the three P, John Cooper resigns and he comes to Anaheim because he's never going to top three straight. Stanley Cup finals, Stanley Cup wins. He's never going to beat that. That's good. Walk out of the door. Just leave. You won three. That it's it. You're fucking. You're you're Al Arbor. You're fucking uh, Scotty Bowman. Like you know what I mean. Like you're that dude now. Walk yeah, out. You're, you're not tough. And then come to Anaheim, baby. Come <laughs> hang out with us. And you and Perry both come here. And it's, oh, it's beautiful. I'm into it. So yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. For for That's reference, you 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 were dead on. 60.9% of his five-on-five five minutes were played with Pat Maroon and Pierre Edward Belmar. The rest of them, he played 9.7% of his minutes with Pat Maroon and Ross Colton. And he did play up in the lineup, but only for 31 minutes and 53 seconds this year. 3.3% of his five-on-five five ice time with Nikita Kucherov and Braden Point. So oh, wow. Almost or over 70% of his five-on-five five ice time, which is almost 700 minutes with Pat Maroon and either at Belmar and Colton. So, and to put up 40 points in 19 goals doing that is, is impressive. It, uh, it was a great season for Perry. I'd love to see him back. I, I hate seeing him, how much it hurt him that he had to leave Anaheim. Every, yeah. every interview you see when he has to talk about it, like it is, he still hurts him to talk yeah, about it. hundred percent. So I would, I would love, I mean, at, at any point, whether it's next year when his contract is up, whatever, whether he signs and plays a full season or he's going to sign and for a one day contract and retire a duck. Like we know that's going to happen. That's a hundred percent going to happen. I just would love for him to come back after winning a cup captain after gets retires and then retire at the end of next season as, the, as a captain with the ducks. That would be great. I would love it in a season. That's not going to matter anyway. Right. right. So it, and uh, again, just like great. having a guy like that who can be a little, uh, dirty and a little nasty and a little grimy and being able to have him out there with Zekris and kind of look after him a little bit, I, I think would be really nice. There's a lot worse guys to put on his wing to kind of look after him. So, uh, so the next is the first line left wing. And I'm think it's so funny that first line left wing and the uh, second left defense uh, we matched on the dream yeah. and we'll get to the left defense in a minute, but um we both pick Matthew Kachuk. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, do we even need to get onto this more than we've done over the last year? Like he's Matthew Kachuk at this point. He's one of the best forwards in the league. Like he seems like he's a legitimate Selkie candidate. He's a, uh, you know, he looks like the kind of guy that could have a year worthy where he would, you know, he looks to me like a guy who could have a year like Perry did and win a heart, right. Yep. Where it's just for one year, he's just that dominant. And even in the years where he's not necessarily heart quality, he's heart quality. You know what I mean? So for me, I, I don't does, know what else they're does saying. It all. He does it all. He's young. He's, you know, again, it's so funny. Like, it's like the one time I was talking about that, like, the NHL is like the one time I turn into like a freaking jingoistic American. But it's just like, 
give me Kachuk, <laughs> Zagris, Terry yeah. for top line. Give me my American boys. Give them to me. Especially in Orange County. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it'd be amazing. Uh, what are you going to do? I just, you know, so uh, anything you want to say. Perfect fit to play with those guys. Like, if you had to invent a player to play with Zegers and Terry <laughs> on that top line, like, Matthew Kachuk is that guy. A guy who can score 40 goals, and he's not necessarily the best shooter in, in the league. He just scores goals in every way possible. Get in front of the net, he'll tip it. He'll, he can pull off, you know, the Michigan if he wanted to, between the legs shot. He's got a, an accurate hard wrist shot. He's got the one-timer. You know, he's just, he just got enough speed and, and power to drive to the net and, 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 you know, force a puck in. Like, he's just, he's one of the best all-around players in the game. We, we talk about, you know, Matthews being that as well. But, like, you know, a guy who is exceptional defensively is a modern-day power forward, has, you know, a top-tier shot, top-tier playmaking ability, the skill to pull off moves, like, there are guys who are really, really good at two or three things, and then it falls off. And he is one of maybe two, three, four players in this league, I think, that can do everything at an elite level. We're talking, you know, Matthews, Barkov, Kachuk. Like, those are the guys, right? Like, and I'm, mm-hmm. there's others I'm sure I'm missing, you know. I mean, it's, it's there's great. always Crosby, right? But yes, to your and, point, yeah. that's... But you know, you know, like McDavid is the best player in the league. I wouldn't put him in that all around because the defensive side of the game lacks for McDavid. He's getting better at it, but it def- you know what I mean. So Kachuk is one of those players, and he's he's probably the only winger on that list as well that you could put up there. Mark Stone, um, a couple of years ago, would probably be the similar type player. But listen, like Matthew Kachuk is is one of my favorite players in the entire league. I love watching the kid play. Um, you know, again, if you, you were talking about bringing Perry back, if you want to bring in the next type of, of Corey Perry, like he's he's the guy to bring in. And the, the thing that, that that makes this, you know, yes, it's a dream target. There is some possibility for this one, you know, five mm-hmm. percent or whatever. But when we're talking about these guys being able to get players like this, usually the answer is there's no way in hell you're getting this guy. Mm-hmm. But the Flames are entering some weird territory next season. Where Johnny Goodrow, 115 point season. He's the easiest one to let go, but you don't. You're not going to want to lose that guy. Part of the best line in hockey with Lindholm and Kachuk. Pending UFA, Kachuk's a pending RFA. You have to sign both of them, and they're going to want a lot of money and a lot of term. Mangiapane is a pending RFA. You've got to re-sign him as well. They have n- almost absolutely nothing coming off the books. Other than I think it's around six to seven million in Zadorov, Goodbranson, Carpenter, Yarn Kruk, um, Troy Brower's buyout penalty comes off. But Sean Monahan has to come off the LTIR. He has you have to pay him, and he has done absolutely nothing. So there has been rumors they're going to buy him out, which I don't think would be smart. I would love it because it would boost the percentage of of a deal like this happening. Um, and I think there's a few extensions that kick in as well. I think Hannafin's extension potentially kicks in. I wrote too much here to go back and read it, but um, you're presumably paying Goodrow and Kachuk around nine to ten million. That's where their salary, I think, is is going to range when we're talking about hundred. Yeah, each when you're talking about a hundred point players, one of them has to go. I don't mm-hmm. think you can bring them both back. Now the likely option is Goodrow, but Goodrow's the first contract you got to figure out here. Yeah. He's the first domino to fall as a pending UFA. If they re-sign him, that puts you in some scary territory here where you don't have enough cap space to prevent you from somebody coming in with just a ridiculous offer sheet and being like, here you go. Because to match the offer sheet, you have to have the cap space available to do it. And if they sign Goodrow for 10, 10 and a half, whatever, you know, whatever he signs for, unless he takes a hometown discount there's a chance for an offer sheet or there's a chance to come in with a trade and give them an offer in, in a mix of players to offset that loss. Now the, the deal is would be immense because of the season that he's coming off of and the age and everything like that. But there there's possibilities of it happening, which I think is something you would never be able to say in a normal situation for a player like Matthew Kachuk. So um, it's a pipe, it's a pipe dream, but it's one with, with some small legs to it. So, yeah. So similar to to Perry, kind of, in 50 fucking ways. But my question to you is, do you think them winning a cup makes it more or less likely he stays? See, it's, it's, it's tough, right? Is 
if they win a cup, is Goodrow more likely to take a home down discount? Maybe, because there you get another shot at going back and getting it again. Or does winning the cup plus a hundred and fifteen point season mean this guy wants to cash in and Kachuk yep. wants to cash in? So it all depends on the player, right? They could go either mm-hmm. way. They could take, you know, Goodrow could take eight million instead of ten to have a few more shots at a cup. Or you can go the opposite way and ask for 11 from a team like New Jersey who has the cap space and mm-hmm. go there and play with Jack Hughes and play, you know, I believe it's his hometown, and play there. Who knows? Matthew Kuchuk, if they win a cup, and he, what if he wins, take, wins the con Smythe? What's he going to ask for? 100 and what, five-point season, Stanley Cup champion, con Smythe winner, you know, whatever, right? Guy should probably be up for the Selkie when you look at the numbers. What's he going to ask for? And he's only 24. Is he going to ask for $11 million? He's going to look at guys across the league and say, like, hey, I'm worth as much as Mitch Marner. I'm worth as much as this yeah. guy, right? Like, I should be getting paid this. If this guy's getting paid this, I want to get paid this. So it's such an interesting situation where I think no matter what, Kachuk's the guy they resign and, and Goodrow's the guy who's going to walk. Yeah, um, I agree. But you never know, right? Like, you never know what a team – Teams have made dumb decisions in the past, and it, it is it is as much as for us and a lot of other people. You look at it and say Kachuk's the obvious choice because of his age. It's very tough to pass up on a guy who's been a part of your organization for this long, been a an extremely key player, led your team in points, 115 points. Uh, you know, has has led you to any success that you've had over the last couple of years. It's mm-hmm. hard to be like, I'll oh, see you later, right? And, you know, so right. it, uh, it it'll be an interesting one. It's going to be tough, but man, I would I would do anything to get Matthew Kachuk here. I don't know what it would take. Maybe you have to take on Lucic's contract or something if you're talking about a trade and give them a little bit more cap space to to go out. Maybe you know, maybe for them it's okay. We lose Kachuk, we lose, but in in turn we we shed Lucic's contract or some other cap space and we go out. And we sign Philip Forsberg, and mm-hmm. we offset it that way. And you know. The window's a bit shorter because Forsberg's a bit older, but we're keeping Johnny Goodrow, so that doesn't matter anyway. And you've sort of replaced that, and you brought in maybe Comtois comes back through the door or something like that or another, you know, I hope it, you know, I would hope it's not McTavish or somebody like that. Right. But you know what I mean? It's going to take, it would take a lot to get Kachuk, even the RFA rights in. You're talking a, a pretty hefty package. So there would there would have to be a lot of moving parts to it. But there there are there are ways to make it work. Uh, between these two teams and it it, uh, it it's possible that that's the the most hope i can provide you is it's, it's possible yeah it's possible though perhaps not probable yes uh but to your point like you said like even if you are just trading as rfa rights like if you had to lose one of them and you were comfortable regardless of you know what it meant for the rest of the lineup if you were comfortable with the number that you and gaudreau came to you're going to get a haul Mm -hmm. if you trade Kachuk, which gives you your best opportunity to try not to lose as much ground as possible. Like you said, you pick up a guy like um, Max Comtois, $2 million, RFA at the end of it, but it's only $2 million today. And if he hits, he's not Max Comtois. I I don't see a world in which Max Comtois demands $7 million a year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. At, At least not on the next deal. Uh, under this current cap situation, I think you're looking at, you know, five by five, something like that in that range. That's more than doable, especially if you move out Lucic. So now you've got that extra cap space. And like you were talking about, you can go big game hunting with Forsberg, with Fiala, with some of these other uh, high end wingers that, that are out there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's the weird thing about Kachuk is he makes the most sense and the least sense. Uh, for Calgary to, to move on from. And, it, and you know, it's, it's why. It's something I didn't even think about is too, is weighing the options of losing Goodrow for nothing or mm-hmm. keeping Goodrow, shortening your window by a couple of years because of the age difference, but getting something for Kachuk. Like the mm-hmm. difference of losing one guy for nothing and maybe set you setting yourself back a bit. Um, to keep Would Kachuk. you move the Bedard pick for him? For Kachuk? Like, if mm-hmm. I had a guaranteed number first overall to get Bedard? That, no, 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 no. Or what I'm saying is... The 2023 20, first, regardless. The 23 first, unprotected. Yeah. If you're getting Kachuk, I'm, 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 I am confident that this team, you know, even if... It depends on who you're moving out, of course. 
But mm-hmm. this team adding Kachuk and like losing Comtois and, and a few other like of the players, yeah, guys who aren't here yet or something like that. This team is better next year with with him in the lineup. Like there, you cannot say that they aren't by adding a player like Matthew Kachuk. They are better with him in the roster. Regardless, they finished tenth last in the league this year. Uh you know, you get the unlikely situation they miss the playoffs and win the lottery, which is tough. Um, and, and maybe, you know, your caveat is you just first overall protect that, that pick. Right. And maybe, maybe that's something you can get away with. Right. Uh, but yeah, like, listen, I, th- I think, I think there's, there's ways to make it work. Like you said, uh, mm-hmm. and the fact that, you know, Calgary just might not want to lose a guy for nothing and keep that, that run alive. Cause they're a great team right now. You know, Lindholm's not necessarily young. I think he's like 26, Goodrill's 28, you know, you know, keep Monje Pane, you know, you can you keep him around as well. You know, you've got Toffoli still in the fold. And if you use that space, you know, moving Kachuk right now, I think saves them 6.75 because that's what he makes now. And then moving Lucic is another 5.5. Like you free up $11 million in space by shipping those two guys out. Come to a 2.3, use seven or eight to go and sign Philip Forsberg. You've then, in a sense, replace like Forsberg is the closest player in free agency available that you don't have to give up assets for to Kachuk and a, a really complete two way player who can play both sides of the game and can put you up 40 goals. I think Forsberg playing on a line with Lindholm and, and Goodrow, you're going to see a guy who can put up 40, 50, and 90 points. It's not a huge drop off from what you got from Matthew Kachuk. And then if you think you can add a Lundestrom or a Comtois, a good young prospect, and a first round pick next year, well, all of a sudden you're like, okay. You know, we've we've replaced the future side of things. If things don't work out, we get another first round pick. We can move that at the deadline for another asset, and and you know shore up some space elsewhere, and we can still compete this year. Um, there's a lot of moving parts there. To you know, you have to get somebody. No, you have to sign somebody like Forsberg to make it worthwhile for trading Kachuk. But it's a fairly. It's probably the best pitch you could any team could give to a player like Philip Forsberg to say, hey, listen. This was the best line in hockey last year. We have two of them left. One guy's gone. You're going to take a spot. You're yeah. going to play with Lindholm and Goodrow next year. Mm-hmm. A guy who put up 115 points and a guy who almost scratched the surface of 100. You're going to play with them. I uh, and you know maybe you don't get you get a 500k less than you would somewhere else, but you've got a legitimate shot at a Stanley mm-hmm. Cup with this team over the next couple of years. So uh, interesting for sure. Uh, so. I'm looking at the cap friendly right now for Calgary, and it's seven million and five point two five for Kachuk and Lucic. But the other thing is, Matthew Kachuk is arbitration eligible. You're not winning that case. No, there's almost no way the team wins if it gets to arbitration. And does anybody think Matthew Kachuk wouldn't play hardball? Like, so again, like you were saying, like the opportunity of losing drove for nothing and then having to then turn around and give Kachuk a, com- a contract that he's certainly worth but maybe you just don't want to shell out right now and you, you have Maja Pani, you can go out and you, you know you can even go get like a Brian Russ type and you know now you're looking at four or five million probably um, so the cap hits down but you're still getting a guy who we've seen play at that elite level so uh, if we ever do those teams that we care about that aren't our team uh, podcasts I think uh Calgary is going to be the second one behind Minnesota. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm fully um, invested in Calgary's off season because of this. Uh, the only the only thing that has, has me worried is the team down the road is in just a good position uh, to go out and try and make a deal like that happen in L.A. Uh, no, they're not. With, no, they're not because with... they're not they're not going to give up the parts. They weren't going to trade the parts away. Hopefully not. All right, we got we got to move off Kachuk because I could probably yeah. we could probably talk about him all night and we're almost at two hours. But we still have the rest of our top line, left wing, and defenseman to get to. So all right, so it's a I, long one. I'm personally fine with not getting too much into any of this. Um, yeah. For my, I'll just run through the bottom three for me you know, real quick. Yeah. My low risk, low cost option is Sonny Milano. My internal option is Max Comtois, and my wild card was Connor Garland. We already talked about Connor Garland. Um, you know, Milano and Comtois, I think we all know what they are. The reason that I didn't put Milano as an internal option, which, spoiler alert, you did, is because of his age, because of what he may ask for, because of his size, I could easily see a situation in which Pat Verbeek trades his rights at the draft. Yep. And he ends up in a good situation, walks into the top. You know what I mean? Kind of having that thing because 
I don't know how much of this year was real. We did see him begin to slow down at the end of the second, you know, at the, towards the end of the season, his production did slow down. Um, again, as with any young player who uh, is having a great season, there's going to be bumps, there's going to be all that dips and things like that. Uh, but I, I just think it wouldn't surprise me if Milano wasn't on this team next year. Yeah, yeah I think so, it all comes down to what his ask is, right? I think that's yeah. the, the, the big thing. Um, yeah, I had Milano as my internal option. It's, again, probably just the easy choice. We, mm-hmm. we know that he does well with Zegras, and Z- him and Zegras and Terry is what a lot of people were calling for for most of the year. So depending on what – I think I put in here, like it depends on kind of what he wants and what the offer is going to be uh, to bring him back. But he, he's kind of the obvious internal option to go there. Uh, my wild card was Dylan Strom, just another guy the Ducks have been linked with at times this year. Uh, played center for most of the season, but we've seen him spend time on left wing uh, when Taves and Kirby Doc were healthy. He kind of shifted to the wing at time. Played, again, a lot with um, Patrick Kane, with Alex Dabrinkit. I think at one point it was Dabrinkit, Strom, Radish. Kind of, they went back to their time in uh, in Erie and they put that yeah. line together and they had they had a lot of success. But he had a career high twenty one goals this year, forty six points in sixty two games played. Not a bad year. He's a pending RFA. Chicago doesn't have a ton of pressure to move him, but there's always just been this like existing rumor over the last couple of years that like he's open to be moved. Like every deadline, his name comes up. He's a guy that, mm-hmm. and Chicago is looking to like really burn it down. It seems like DeBrinket and Kane have been rumored to be guys they could trade. I don't think Strom is safe if those guys aren't safe, especially Debrinket. Like if Debrinket's on the market, Strom's on the market for you know picks and prospects. If Chicago's really looking to tear this down, so um, I can see that being an option. And then the low risk option, low risk, low cost option I had was Mason Marchment from the Florida Panthers. So I re- I myself a nice postseason. Yeah, I I really like him. Um, having a pretty good postseason. Um, uh, Carter Verhage is still in the show in Florida, but Mason Marchman's, you know, doing pretty good. Great year too. Sixteen. At the time I wrote this, I don't know what he finished at, but at the time I wrote this, he had sixteen goals and forty-two points in fifty games. He only makes eight hundred k. He has probably be one of the like if we're talking about um, points per, you know, salary points per dollar. He's got to be near the top of the list in in terms of his production this year. Um, I, I also love that he came from Toronto. And uh, <laughs> well, they had their own in this year, Michael Bunting. But uh, yeah, he played a, a lot of the season with Barkov. Again, makes sense. You know, you look at that and say the production is, is because of Barkov. His underlying numbers look great. I posted his RAPM chart in our little um, you know area where we kind of wrote all our stuff out here, and it's it's all dark blue, uh, all dark blue bars full. So he had a, an exceptional season. Um, currently when I wrote this, he was playing with Anton Lindell and Sam Reinhardt. So again, still playing up in the lineup, but he is a pending UFA and the Florida Panthers are going to be in cap hell next year. We're going to get to that in a second. Uh, was it Ekblad's extension kicks in Barkov? No, uh, Barkov's extension kicks in. Barkov's extension kicks Ekblad's in. Ekblad's is already on his thing. He's still on his seven and a half extension from his rookie year. Yeah. This, or from his rookie deal. Yandel's, uh, bio. Clause goes mm-hmm. up to like spikes up to like almost five point three million. It goes up three million, so three million dollars of cap space gets eaten that way. There's not a lot of guys coming off the books, and with some of the extensions kicking in, all of a sudden there's really no money to go around. Um, mm-hmm. Again, it's an option, so maybe you can take Hornquist's salary and get Mason Marchman back, or maybe they just can't re-sign Mason Marchman because he's going to ask for a significant raise. He heads into free agency, and he's just a guy that you can just sign as a free agent, mm-hmm. and you let, you tell him, listen, I, we're going to play you with Zegris and Terry. You're going to get the same opportunities you got in Florida playing with guys like Barkov. You're going to get first-line minutes here. Uh, and you know, he, he's not going to get four or five because he only made 800 k and it's one good season playing with one of the best players in the league. You know he's either going to get a show me deal, you know, two or three for two years, or he's going to try and lock it, you know, lock in three and a half or something for four or five. And I think at that point, he's a really good low risk, low cost option. Has shown he can play with with you know very good players and and be a solid contributor. So he was kind of my um my my secondary option. But he does again. He just reminds you a lot of Milano, right? One really good season playing with some really mm-hmm. good players. Because before this. He had 11 points in his previous 37 NHL games before jumping in to the best offensive team in NHL history and playing with, with Alexander Barkov. So, 
yeah, I, I, I like him, not sold on it, uh, but he would be my, my low risk, low cost option as a, you know, there's not many low cost options that you can get as a first line left winger. And I think he's, right. he's one of the top of that list. So real quick, before we jump to the two defensemen, there's one more name I want to throw in here and listen, I was kind of just looking at what we have and stuff laid out. And I was thinking about why did I have Max Comtois and you didn't or whatever. And I was thinking about it, the fact that we had Max Comtois listed as the third line right wing. Well, in the event that Max Comtois moves up to the top line left wing, there's actually someone who's already in there to step into that third line in Max Jones, who's coming back. On the other hand, if to a significantly lesser degree, you want to do something similar to the Terry thing and maybe give someone with a little bit more goal scoring onto Lundestrom's left side and give him Comtois, Max Jones can step up and do something similar to what Connor Garland does as far as being the forechecker, being the go-getter, being the guy who provides a little bit of that that kind of physicality and that nastiness to that line and still is able to play with those guys. So, uh, you know, we don't need to go on much more than that, but I just wanted to say Max Jones because obviously – uh, we love him, and he just kind of got lost in the shuffle this year, yeah. unfortunately, with that pec injury. So yeah, yeah, he he'll be a lot of fun to see where he slots in next year. He's, I think we mentioned this in the last podcast, but he's one of the guys I'm most excited to see mm-hmm. next year because he had a whole off season. Like the guy was already huge, like to begin with. Like he's <laughs> and he just I, I saw I think it was an Instagram post or a Twitter post for him, and like he spent the whole off season just like continuing to get more jacked. So the guy, like, I would not want to play against this guy next year. I would not want to come up against him. I, I hope the the hockey side of things is is come along too. But like, he's going to be a tough guy to line up against on the other side of the ice next year. As long as he can carry around that extra weight on his skates, then he yeah. should be a a fun guy to watch. And it's always it's always exciting to see a guy we all kind of liked when he was here and was starting to kind of come into his own. Misses a whole season. It's exciting to see what you've got in this guy now we, we saw nothing of him last year obviously so um and, and it was like you know we thought we were gonna see him and then i think it was like 20 minutes before the start of game one no no he's out and then done for the year so it's yeah. uh, it'll be fun to see him back i actually want to flip this last two i want to do the left defenseman first yeah. because i think that's you know the answers that we kind of have make a little bit of sense in a, a very simple way yeah. uh so again this is the other one where we agreed on the dream target, and we both picked Jacob Chikrin. We've talked about it before. Yeah, we know what he is. Times. We know <laughs> all the benefits of it. You know, he's young. He's uh, he had an incredible offensive season the year before. This year, his offensive numbers jumped, but his defensive numbers improved, and the entire team was worse. I am not worried about his offensive production if I am a team looking at bringing him in because he's shown that even with just a little bit more skill in, in the lineup, he can produce offensively. And with less skill in the lineup, he can still play well defensively. I, I don't know what else you kind of need to be other than he only makes like $4.6 million or something for three more years. Like, I don't know what else, you know, there is to say for me, as far as what Jacob Chikrin makes, the, makes a ton of sense as a dream target for that second left uh second left defenseman spot yeah yeah I, there's not much more to say about him uh he's the obvious dream option of guys who could be available um you know the the only the only sticking point against the the asking price of what arizona wanted was the main reason he didn't get dealt at the deadline it was like two firsts and a top prospect plus on top of their three first or something at, at one point so, yeah it was equivalent of like three four for three or four first round picks, yeah. and they wanted recent first round picks so mm-hmm. you know even from an Anaheim perspective, Lundstrom's not getting it done. No, you're talking you know, about you're looking at and guys like Perot, that, yeah. McTavish, those kind of guys. So ho- uh, hopefully that comes down a bit. Ultimately, like the sad thing is, I think he ends up with the Los Angeles King. I think they have the, the the prospects to get it done in a team that is desperate to build on the playoff run that they had this year and ultimately fell short. So I think he goes there, but still my dream option for Anaheim. Uh, as long as the price comes down, I I, I I don't think I would give up, you know, for the equivalent of four first round picks uh, for him. As much as I like him, that's essentially like offer sheeting the guy ten and a half million dollars, mm-hmm. right? Like that's yeah, that's a that's a tough go. But uh, yeah, no, not much more we can say. We've we've talked Chikrin to death since the trade deadline. Um, so I, I I almost have no interest in talking more about Jacob Chikrin. We beat we beat uh, that horse to death. The only other name we had similar here uh, in different spots internally, 
I had Olin Zellweger as the option, but I, I think he does fit better where you had him in as the wild card option mm-hmm. as the second line pair. Um, yeah, I, I think he, outside of McTavish, he's the next guy who's going to get a run. I think he, I think uh, we mentioned this on the last show. I wouldn't be surprised to see him get a nine game look just because he can't go back. He can't go to the American hockey league. So it's either junior or the NHL. Uh, no matter how he does in camp, the Ducks' left side is like there's nothing there. Like there's there's no reason this guy shouldn't get a, a you know an eight or nine game look just to see what he can do at the NHL level. Um, and and that's why you know I I think he fits better as the wild card because it is up to how he does in training camp and how he does in that nine game stint. So it is a you know, wild card option because he can either do good or bad. He's either going to prove he's ready or he's not. Um, so I, you know, obviously he fits as an internal option because he's coming up from, from below. But he he is going to be the one to watch because there is a, as we're projecting this, a hole on the second side, uh, left side of defense behind Cam Fowler, and uh, you know nobody's really been able to take that over. Obviously, you know since Hampus Lindholm leaving, like Josh Mahura, Simon Benoit, Jacob Larson, Brendan Gooley, like they're not really inspiring names to take over that yeah. spot. For sure. um, and from what we've seen in Zellweger in, in junior this year, it's just an unbelievable. He looked good in the one game that he had in, in the playoffs for the goals. Um, he seems like a guy that normally you'd say because of the size as a defenseman, there's absolutely no way in hell this guy is going to play in the NHL next year. But he, the way he plays the game, like, you're, you're like okay, maybe. Like, there's a chance that he could stick around. So I, I like him as, uh, as that potential option. Yeah, and I, I think just like, you know, uh, th- another reason that he fit to me so well in the wild card spot is because they have to make up their mind. Like you said, he can't play in the AHL. So it's not even like, all right, we're going to send him back down to Cook for a little bit longer and bring him up in January. This is, if he's not on the team, he's in juniors. And to the point we said earlier about Pat Verbeek wanting these guys to dominate, he's done that. So the question is just, is he going to be physically emotionally and and mentally ready or mature enough to step into the nhl and and you know I, a cards on the table i don't think he makes his team next year i i think maybe he gets five six games maybe he gets the full nine and they send him back down but i i have a hard time uh for me seeing him on this team next year but and I feel like i always find reasons to bring up other sports on this podcast to steal a quote from soccer if he's good enough, he's old enough. Yep. You know, you know, and and if there was anybody who, who, who just had the raw talent and skill to be a to be able to tread water at the NHL level as a rookie, as an undersized rookie, it's him. I just, you know, there's no reason to think he can't have at least as good a year as Jamie Dreesdale had uh, last year yep. or this year. You know. I, I, Again, power play depth, uh, just a, a phenomenal skill set. Uh, and, you know, like you said, especially with, uh, who is it, Thrun and Lakeham, uh, for sure going back to college, there doesn't seem to be anybody really else on that left side uh, as far as an inspiring name uh, to kind of step into that spot. Um, yeah, and I, th- I think the thing with, with Zellweg is what we have to remember too is um, he was undersized when we drafted him as one of the youngest players in the draft. Now he's still undersized related to like the typical NHL defense when we're talking over six feet because he's 5'10, 174 pounds. Jamie Drysdale's f- listed as 5'11, 174 pounds. <laughs> like, which for the record, neither of them are that tall. No, right? So he, he's <laughs> not far off from what Drysdale is right now, or he's probably identical to what Drysdale was when he came into the league. So. He's had a couple of years. He's grown an inch or two. He'll probably be between 5'10 and 5'11 when he comes into the league next year. So undersized for a defenseman. But again, not outside the norm of guys like Sam Gerrard and mm-hmm. Jamie Drysdale and Quinn Hughes and others, right? Like he, he's right around that size where if the skill is there and it translates to the NHL right away, he'll make it happen. Like he will, mm-hmm. he will make it work. And he's got the, like this again. If you want to succeed as an undersized defenseman in the NHL, you need to have game-breaking speed and skill to get away from opposition and slip around checks. 
this kid has it. So that, mm-hmm. that that's why I think, again, I think he fits better as the wild card because it's all about how quickly he can translate that game to the NHL level and how quickly he adjusts. And uh, I'm, I'm with you. I don't think it happens next year. But I, I think the chances are, you know, he's got a 20 30% chance in my opinion. It's an arbitrary number, but I think that's the chances of that happening um, and, and going because, you know, he's, he has nothing left to prove at junior, which, which is, this, again, this is where I start to hate the CHL rule. I understand it. I get mm-hmm. it because I've grown up with, with hockey here, and I understand, like, without that rule, the, the leagues would be destroyed. Like, they would be pointless. But – Man, like the, for kids like this, like there is no reason for him to go back to Everett next year whatsoever. He would right. benefit so much more from being able to play in the American Hockey League. But he would almost be better sending him overseas, go play yeah. in Finland for a year. Yeah, even that. But uh, we'll see. Uh, he'll get the, he'll get the chance. That's the that's the the, the thing we can say. He's gonna get the, the nine game stint. Mm-hmm. He's gonna get training camp. He'll get the chance to prove he's ready. Um, and it's up to him to take it. Yeah. Um, my internal just to your point, was Gooley. Again, like you said, not the most inspiring name, but I think of all the names that we've kind of said, uh, as far as having second pair potential, he's the one guy that I think uh, has the ability to step into that. And it's just because I think he's still a little bit of an unknown because he's been struggling with injuries. And, you know, he got a couple games in and he looked fine to me. I don't think he looked great. He didn't, but he looked fine. He's a good skater. He makes a good pass and he's got deep, good vision. So for me, I would rather see it be Gooley uh, than Mahura or, God forbid, fucking Jacob Larson. Uh, he's got to be gone. Know. He's a pending RFA. There's absolutely no way he's gone. back next year. Uh, but, yeah, so for me, Gooley was my internal option just because I think that it, there's just the most question marks with him. Yeah. And I would be I would be more invested in answering those questions than getting more of whatever Mahura is, which is – a bottom pair defenseman and that's perfectly fine i don't want to i don't want to be dismiss what he is i don't want to be disrespectful it's just more of i think at this point he's kind of clearly a bottom three defenseman at that point with the rebuild going the direction it's going and having this kind of time to invest in these guys and really give them runs i just think Gooley makes the most sense uh, of the guys left but you had two interesting names that were uh, you had Gustav Forsling and Travis Sanheim. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Sanheim was your wild card. Why don't you just kind of walk me through some of those? Because they both caught me off guard completely. Yeah, I'll start with the wild card because we'll, we'll wrap up all the categories except low cost, low risk. So, yeah, Sanheim was my wild card. And mostly because a lot of it just depends on what the Flyers are going to have to do in the offseason and who they're going to move. They have a few different options of guys they could trade. If somebody would take JVR's contract, that means they don't have to move Sandheim. So it really all depends on who they want to move. But Sandheim's name was one that came up at the trade deadline. It's come up after the trade deadline because of the cap situation the Flyers are in. So uh, I put him in my wild card spot. So the Flyers have to shed some cap in the offseason. They've got Couturier's extension kicking in, which I think is an extra $3 million. They've got Farabee going from entry level to $5 million. They signed Ristolainen to an extension. His cap hit comes down like six hundred k, but he still makes $5.1 million next year. Uh, they've got Ryan Ellis, who makes over six. They've got Provorov, who makes a ton of money. So it's probably not wise to have... I think it's almost $22 million invested in four defensemen. Somebody's going to have to make way. Ellis is not the guy. Ristolainen, after signing extension, is not the guy. And I don't think you want to move Provorov because I would I would say he's clearly their best defenseman uh, on the team. So Sandheim becomes the option there. And um, he's such an intriguing case. I honestly was surprised, one, to find out he played – over 60% of his, his <laughs> five on five minutes with Rasmus Ristolainen. So seeing that and us knowing, you know, the last couple of years, Ristolainen has been the bane of all analytics people. Like he has been a guy, nobody understands how he keeps getting the contracts that he does because he just looks like a tire fire when you look at his underlying numbers. I get it. He, he's a great one, or not great. He's a good 1v1 defender. He's got some size to him. He's a good player in that sense, like, yeah, at some things, but the rest of it just falls apart. I fully expected Sandheim, the guy who played with him for almost 61% of his minutes at 5v5, would look just as bad. Somehow, the complete opposite. He was above average defensively 
for a guy who was well below average defensively when we're talking about expected goals against and Corsi, Corsi against per 60. And his play driving, his expected goals against, his actual goals against, his Corsi 4 per 60 were among the best on the team. For us, like it made no sense. I don't know what this guy is doing. It's it's somehow he is fighting all odds, or at least the other forty percent of the time that he's on the ice without wrist alignment, he's a superstar because his his numbers somehow are completely the inverse of what what his his partner is. I don't think I've ever seen that. I don't know any defensive pairs where one guy's chart looks like the inverse of the other guy's chart. I don't know how that's possible, but it it, it does. And under Mike Yo too. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> He he just he looks like an interesting case. He, you know, I think he was a former first round pick. Um, he only makes four point six seven five for this year and next, I think. And for for Philly, like you said, you got to trade somebody, and they can move Sandheim and bump Cam York right into that spot. You know, they've got mm-hmm. a guy who played a full season this year, close to a full season. Uh, they could bump him up into you know a fourth line spot. He's gonna have to play with Ristolainen <laughs> because Provorov and Ellis are gonna be together. Uh, but it. Uh, if you're going to cut costs somewhere, it's nice to have a young player that you feel comfortable yeah. with that could step up in into that role. Um, and in, in Anaheim's side of things, I think Sandheim is a really good second option behind Cam Fowler, potentially to play either with Shattenkirk or Drysdale. And it's not coming at uh, a very expensive cap hit. He's likely, because of the need to shed space, and it's not a chicker, and he's not going to cost you as much as uh, one of those guys would. So that uh, the, there's a benefit to, to that as well. And he's young enough that when that contract is up, you can look at extending him depending on how, how well he's done. And if not, you can move him and you can get something for him. So I think there there's you know a low low risk to that. But it's just a wild card just because Philly could do a bunch of different things to shed cap. And they might not want to move on from a guy who statistically was one of their best defensemen. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so what's up with your boy Gus? Yeah, he, he, he's been an, an, an interesting one. Um, again, uh, you know, an offense generating machine since joining the Florida Panthers, he posted career high of 37 points to 71 games this year. Um, still putting up above average results defensively. So yeah, he's more of an offensive defenseman, but he's still getting it done defensively. I don't know how much of that is the fact that he's played with Radko Gudis. So, it, you know, it, there's a little bit of less responsibility there that he can just kind of run and gun things. And mm-hmm. Gudis is always going to be there at his own blue line, anchoring the, the defense. So it makes <laughs> things a little bit easier. You're playing on one of the highest scoring teams in the league. You've got a great defense as well. So the numbers are always going to look inflated. Um, and, you know, he was claimed off waivers. So at one point, things weren't working out when he was with um, with Carolina. But I do like what I've seen from him every time I've watched him. I like the thought of bringing in a pure offensive defenseman. Um, I don't know now with the loss of Josh Manson, the Ducks really have the best player to play him with. Like, I think you have to play him with a a stay-at-home guy because of the way Forsling plays and the success he has, success he has had being that guy who has the freedom to get it done. So maybe you can play him with a Benoit instead and slot Shattenkirk down. Or if you bring in a a right-shot defensive defenseman, Maybe mm-hmm. if, if Hellison can prove he's ready, something like that, right? A guy who's going to stay at home um, and, and lock things down at uh, in their own end. But I, I, I do like him as that option. I like Sandheim more. I like Chikrin more. But I think he is a low-cost, low-risk. Um, I'm trying to remember if he had uh, his contract up or not. I can't, I'd can't. i have to double-check that. I didn't write it in here. But normally you don't bank on a team – as good as Florida wanting to move on from a guy like this, but we've talked briefly already about Florida's cap situation heading into this off season, uh, limited cap relief coming off the books and it's Barkov and Verhage whose extensions kick in. That was the other guy that we were missing. And then obviously Yandel, the Yandel's buyout penalty rises from approximately 2.3 million to 5.3 million. So they're going to have to find ways to shed salary. They're going to have to do what all the top teams in this league have done after, you know, being competitive or, or, they might win a Stanley Cup. They are down two nothing to to the Lightning right now. Is finding ways to get bad contracts off the books and to save money. So whether that's them throwing Forsling into a deal to take Patrick Hornquist's contract and essentially shedding eight million dollars in one go, or it's you know finding a way for them to just get rid of Forsling 
and and you giving them you know some cheaper assets in return um you know an isaac lindstrom or something like that to fill out their bottom you know their bottom six forward group if they're able to find somebody to take on hornquist so there's a lot of different ways you can go about it but for them you know forzen kind of feels like the odd man out when you've got you know your top four presumably Ekblad, Uyghur, Gudis, and then Brandon Montour, I would say. He's been good enough to be that guy. So I think it comes down to Montour or Forsling, who they make a decision between. And I, I think because of the success of Forsling and Gudis, it could be Montour, but we'll have to see. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, my low-cost option for basically all the same reasons is Marcus Pedersen. Uh, I had a bit of a theme of just bringing guys home. Uh I, I love Marcus Patterson, man. I think he's just such a solid, num- like uh, number four defenseman on a team. Like he, he just, he's really good. He's steady. He's got decent size. He's a really good skater. He, he can make passes. He, you know, he can, he can play all, all three, all three zones, all three units, the whole thing. Uh, and you know, like I, like I was saying, it's similar reasons is. Uh, Pittsburgh has a, a fair chunk of cap space this summer, but they also have a, some important UFAs. And, you know, we just heard that they offered three by five uh, to both Malkin and Latang, and Crosby was pissed because he didn't think that number was high enough. Look, I, I think that's a little silly because at a certain point, you just have to make less money. I don't think those deals are, are necessarily unfair. Uh, especially given their age, their injury history, and his three-year commitment. Yeah. But I also understand that there is an emotional and a human side to this. And Evgeny Malkin means a ton to that franchise. Chris Letang means a ton to that franchise. So if they need to start moving guys out, uh, maybe Pedersen is a guy who you know is under contract for another three or four years. He only makes about $4 million. So he's just someone that I thought could be an interesting one because I don't see them moving Marino. Uh, I don't think they're going to move... Uh, Dumoulin or anybody like that. So I just thought Marcus Pedersen was an interesting one. You know, you know what you're getting from him, and it's just solid. Yeah, and you've got a guy who uh, we talked about at the trade deadline as a potential guy Pittsburgh could move. They ended up not, and Pierre Olivier Joseph, who had a great year in the AHL, and is a guy that makes a lot less money that could potentially just slot right into where Marcus Pedersen was for them, right? And, yeah. and you save some money that way, and you have an internal promotion candidate who could come in. And the Penguins, listen, they always find these guys out of nowhere. I don't know where they find half of these guys that come in and play for the roster and somehow are, are yeah. <laughs> they, they work out like... Jay Gensel came out of nowhere when he first appeared and is now one of the top players in this league. You've got Rust, you know, Ashton Reese, Simone, other guys like that, like that have just kind of come out of nowhere. Teddy Bluger at one point was like a 40 point guy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wild that they produce these guys. So they'll find some guy in college or play yeah. in the fourth division in Switzerland that will come over and, <laughs> and, uh, and be a key contributor for them. But all right, we're on to the last one, right? Let's go, baby. Third pairing, right defense. We'll get it out of the way quick. We have a similar target for our internal option, Simon Benoit. Yeah. I felt like it was kind of the obvious one. Of of all the I guys agree. we talked about, Mahura, Gooley, Larson, he's the guy that stuck around the most this year, the guy that looked like he fit a third pairing role the best. Just to, He plays the game simple, and he does the simple things well. Right, He's a big, mm-hmm. physical guy. He's tough to play against. You're not getting much else from him, but if you're going to look at an internal option, let's get the guy who's had the experience, who's you know worked his ass off to get where he is. A guy, you know, I I would put above anybody else if we had to say who's going to work the hardest to earn that spot. It's going to be Simon Benoit. So I I thought he was uh, an easy option for that internal choice. Yeah, no, I I think the same thing. Um... Uh, yeah, I just real quick. I want to see how many games he played. Yeah, he played 53 games and he finished second on the team in hits with 168. Yeah. Uh, the only player who had more than him was Nick Delorier in 61 games. So he's exactly what you think he is. Um, but like you said, he's got good size. He's a competent skater. He's steady. He's physical. He he seems to know exactly what he is, and I just think if nothing else, he's an undrafted free agent, and that's fucking cool. Let's have our own Mark Donk on the back end. Uh, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, he just, easy guy to root for, really easy guy to like. Uh, 
Uh, he's shown a surprising nice little slap shot, actually. He kind of yeah. stepped into a couple over the, the times this year. He's not going to score a lot of points, but, you know, I don't give a shit. I'll take four goals a year from him if it's what he's got. Um, hey, we got to go wild card here. Yeah. I, I'm going to quickly state mine because it's not anything special. And I got I to gotta hear about your pick for wild card because I, I, I don't <laughs> understand it. But I haven't read your, your blurb yet, so I want to hear it. Uh, quickly, my wild card option was Drew Hellison. If we're talking about right hand shot options behind Drysdale and Shattenkirk, the Ducks don't really have anybody. Probably the top option now that Hunter Drew's a forward is Drew Hellison. Mm-hmm. I it, self admittedly did not get to watch a lot of goals games this year. Um, so looking, I know he's not an offensive guy, Drew Ellison. Looking at the numbers of 17 games, two assists, and like a minus nine or something, it didn't look great. Uh, from what I've heard from from people who've actually got to watch the games this year, it wasn't as bad as it looked. Again, it's an adjustment period coming from college in your first 17 games of pro hockey. He seemed to, I guess, look better as the games went on. He had two assists in the two playoff games, so maybe you know things started to, to kind of get figured out at that point. But if anybody ha- if they want a right shot option, if anybody has the best chance to be a wild card option, I think it would be Drew Hellison. Um, has a good training camp potentially, gets a little bit of a look at the start of the season if they want that right-handed option. He could potentially lock it down um if you know he can catch up to to the pro game so uh, ultimately i think he spends the whole season in san diego and get maybe gets a few games here or there but he he'd be my wild card pick as a guy who could surprise and and play more games than we expected yeah i think you know like everything you just said to me um makes a ton of sense and i guess the quick summary of it is he's the defensive jacob pro he's really the guy with the only real mix of uh, ability and opportunity to step into a you know that that kind of right that uh, right defensive role and like you said with Josh Manson gone and maybe with him being a, a little bit more of a standard stay at home guy a modern stay at home obviously uh, you know Zegers talked about what a great skater he is they played together at US NTDP and all that stuff um, he's just a really interesting guy you know he's gonna get opportunities obviously based on uh, uh, the fact that Pat Verbeek went out and got him you know what I mean. And he traded away a fan favorite, Josh Manson, to get him. So I don't think that's nothing, uh, you know. So yeah. Uh, so again, I cheated. Uh, my my third <laughs> pair of right shot defenseman is Shea Weber. Um, the look on your face is hilarious right now. I think we, I, like I said, I cheated. I think at the end of the day, I think if you ask Shea Weber, uh, he played his last. He played, he's played his last professional hockey game. He played a very long time. He played a very heavy style. He has more than earned the right to sit out the last couple of years of that contract. On the beach in Anaheim. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I fucking hate that guy, like, with everything. But that's because he was, you know, one of the best predators of all time. And for me, an interesting sliding doors moment is instead of Corey Perry with that second first-round pick, what if they took Shea Weber? Uh I just always thought that was a very interesting one. If you really wanted, you could say, why not Patrice Bergeron? And like, yeah, sure, but whatever. I, I think the Shea Weber thing of having that number one defenseman, number one center in, in the system and all that stuff. He makes seven, almost $7.9 million for another four years uh, uh, against the cap, sorry. But his actual paid out salary is only $6 million, three next year and then a million each the following three seasons. It's not going to cost Anaheim really all that much money to to pay him to not play. Uh, on top of that, he does have that 7.9. They do need to hit the cap. This gives them a buffer going forward. This gives them an extra you know, $8 million in cap hit that if they need to move to LTIR, they can't because he's clearly not playing. But if they don't have to, he just gives them that little bit of buffer and a little extra bit of room to, to, to you know have some – be flexible with your cap. Um, and like we talked about, like Montreal needs to clear people out. They just don't have cap space and they don't have room. And maybe, you know, Carrie Price and Shea Weber are just on LTIR and in Montreal uh, until their deals expire. Uh, the whole Carrie Price situation seems incredibly fluid. So I don't want to say if he is or isn't done. Um, but Shea Weber, I, I really do think, is pretty much certain to have played his last game uh, as an NHL player at this point. And so I just thought, you know, again, trying to embrace the idea of the wild card, uh, look at something that maybe Anaheim could use to bring some assets in, 
have the general asset uh, uh, of that cap hit and the ability to move it to LTIR. The payout is incredibly low because, again, that Shea Weber deal is one of those uh, front-loaded deals that changed the entire CBA. Um, you know, and best worst comes to worst, and he actually just retires. It fucks over predators and not us, which I think is perfect. So yeah, so like I said, it was it was a little bit of a cheat, but I I just think it it's a really interesting way to kind of again look at where this team is and, and kind of how they can move forward because for a rebuilding team, yeah, man, eat that eight million dollar cap hit for another four years. Yeah, but you know, uh, by the time it might matter, Silverberg and Henrique are going to be off um, off the book, so it doesn't necessarily matter that you're going to be in your 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 real payout for. Zegris and Treesdale and 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 uh, Terry and and probably at that point McTavish, right? He'll be on his second deal at that point. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I cheated. I know I cheated, but I I, I thought it was worth it. Yeah. No, uh, it's worth it. It's creative. I like it. I can't complain. Um, right. I like your actual pie in the sky one though. I want to finish off with the dream targets. We got to okay. finish off because those are our top ones for this. Um, so we got our low risk options here. You had, or I guess I'll go first. I had Zach Whitecloud, who you, you turned me on to the Zach Whitecloud train. Of he's a good player, man. Yeah, he he's a lot of fun to watch. Um, he's a kind of a prototypical like stay at home shut down defenseman, but he's got a little bit of offense to his game. Like he can he can show up when he he's played with Shea Theodore for a bit this year, and and again. You know, anytime you play a sheet theater, you're going to pick up points if you just give him the puck. But he's he's got a little bit of, of offensive uh, side to his game as well. So what the the difficult thing about this one is White Cloud is an extension that kicks in for next season. I think it's like seven years at two point seven five yeah. million dollars or something. They like, gave him basically the David Poyle special, which is we'll extend you forever, but we're going to keep the cap at tiny. Which I, I love. I would love to have Jeez. that deal in Anaheim and yeah, bring him 100%. over here. Um, the reason I think that like, there's a possibility here is that the Gold Knights are strapped for cash. We all know this. They're in the worst cap situation of anybody. They've got to figure out a way to be able to have all their top guys in the lineup next year. Um, and they're going to have to get creative to find ways to shed some salary. So Riley Smith is up pending a UFA, so there's been rumors they want him back, but they might have to let him go. Uh, <laughs> so if they, if they try and bring him back, there, there's only a limited amount of options of guys you can move to Adenov again. You can, you can try and explore that route and move him. Uh, but White Cloud could be an interesting one because there's the, for me, there's a clear top four defenseman on that team. It's Theodore Petrangelo and then McNabb and Martinez. Like That mm-hmm. is their top four. When you look at salary, those are the four highest paid guys on the blue line. Those are likely going to be your top four guys. Uh, as a team this high up against the cap, it's kind of a luxury to be paying a guy $2.75 million to play in your bottom pair. Um, you know, Petrangelo is likely going to play with Theodore. Like that is the long term goal, and that should be the long term plan for them is to play those two guys together. Uh, I, I'm fine with you know if Martinez wants to play with McNabb, or you have Martinez and McNabb playing with two other guys who make you know round league minimum, then that's fine. You can kind of spread it out that way. So mm-hmm. it does make White Cloud, despite how great his contract could be, surplus to requirements. And whether it's the Ducks just going in and, and taking white cloud off the books and saving them two and it's point seven five million dollars maybe it's revisiting the data situation and trying to see if he's more willing to, to make that move in the off season and having white cloud as a throw into that deal and saving the gold knights almost eight million dollars in cap space I, I can hear jimmy screaming from here <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah like there, there's some there, there's there's ways to make it work. And, yeah, he played the majority of the season with Shea Theodore at eight goals, 19 points, and 59 games. He just looks like he could be an excellent partner for some of the d- defensemen the Ducks either have or ones that we've talked about coming in. I think he'd be a great pairing for Cam Fowler, you know, a defensive stalwart to let him do what he wants to do. be great for Olin Zellweger to potentially mm-hmm. be paired with a guy like that to allow him some, some freedom offensively. And, you know, guys like Chikrin and Forsling, we've talked about, again, pairing them with a, a solid defensive defenseman like White Cloud who has enough offensive instincts to, you know, make the, f- the first pass out of the zone or get in a good position uh, to get a shot off. I think he's a really good pairing for some of the defensemen the Ducks have and some of the guys we've rumored to have come in. So there's, there's uh, and that contract, man, that contract over seven years um, is it's, it's it's movable. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's he projects as a guy that 
is going to be able to do what he does comfortably for the next six to the seven duration years, of right? that like contract. It's, yeah. It's never going to feel like a bad deal. Yeah. No, I, I think the interesting thing about why Clyde, you're talking about that offensive upside and how, you know, that kind of does just come from playing with Shea Theodore, but uh, I don't think that's entirely unfair, especially when you look at some of the players that Anaheim already has on that left side, right? The idea of bringing in a guy like White Cloud to me, to me, he has that kind of Josh Manson offensive ability where it's like he's got just enough to make things happen every now and then, but nobody is asking that of him. He's going to be physical. He's going to protect, you know, he's going to protect his own end. He's he, he's going to be a presence. But if he finds himself on a breakaway or if he finds himself with an open lane, you know, from the blue line, like he's not going to be afraid to rip it. And I, I think that's great. I, you know, look, I, yeah, I mean, I, I would have a really hard time saying no to uh, Dreesdale and White Cloud being the top two right D for the next seven years. Like, I just, I'm into it, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, so the, the guy I ended up picking for my low cost option is uh, actually tied to your pie in the sky guy. Uh, my guy was Ilya Labushkin. Um, he doesn't have a ton of miles on him. So the fact that I think he's almost 27, 28 already isn't necessarily a huge issue. Um, he's put up surprisingly strong defensive numbers. Uh, even back when he was in Arizona, he had, you know, uh, his first year he was garbage, but he was his first year. Who cares? Um, but this year in Arizona, last year in Arizona, this year with Toronto, he's a perfectly solid right shot veteran defense. Uh, not even a veteran, like I said, he hasn't played some games, but like uh, he's a perfectly solid right shot defenseman. And I think if you're looking at that, that third role, uh, he's a guy that you can pretty much play anywhere. Um, but if he's on your third pair, I, you're in a good spot. And I don't think he should be uh, uh, too expensive. And I think a player of that ability, you could talk into taking a two or three year deal um, at a relatively lower cap hit and then having the opportunity to then quickly turn that into one more big contract on the other end, right? Because I think at 29-30, he's probably going to still be able to get four or five years uh, at a good cap hit. So he, you're not robbing him of the ability to, to kind of make that life-changing money in a way. Yeah. Um, so I, I just think he's a good steady option. I, again, low risk, low cost. I don't think it's going to cost a lot, and I don't think there's a lot to to lose in bringing him in. And if it doesn't work out, you can trade him. Yeah. No. I and the games I watched uh, for him in Toronto, I I he's been steady, right? Like mm-hmm. where whereas you've noticed the mistakes that guy like Justin Hall made uh, on a nightly basis watching the Leafs in the playoffs. Labushkin was a, a guy that you didn't notice too much, and with those types of defensemen, when you don't notice them, they're doing their job well, right? So he mm-hmm. was, um, he, he'd be a guy I'd be okay with uh, coming in and being, you know, whether it's a, a second, a second pair, you know, he's not the second pair guy, but you're pairing him with a Fowler or with a Zellweg or something like that because of the fit with that, and then Shattenkirk slots down as the third pair uh, defenseman, you know. Well, it's like what we talked about with McTavish and Lundestrom being both the second line centers. Right. Essentially, the they're both the second pair through the third pair defensemen, just because there's real no difference between them. Um, all right, dream targets. Who'd you have? Well, I know who you had, but tell everybody who you had. So. I I uh, I had the one and only the Tom Wilson of the blue line, Radko Gudis. Again, to go back to what we were talking about with some of the forwards that we had brought up. Radko Gudis is a mean son of a bitch. And I, I know there are people who don't like this or, or don't think this is real, but Anaheim got pushed around at the, after the deadline. Um, I think they got pushed around before a fair bit, but it became infinitely more noticeable when the only guy who was able to move a body out of there was Simon Benoit. Um, and I think whether they move Gibby or not, whoever's in goal, they're not going to want guys standing on their heads. Redko Gudis is going to move fucking guys out of there. He is, he's such a nasty and mean son of a bitch, man. And he's so strong defensively, it's actually remarkable. Like when you see someone that makes some of the dumbass decisions that he does, because let's be honest, he's crossed the line a fair number of times. He seems to have really toned it down uh, since uh, leaving Philly, because I think at Tampa and Philly is kind of really where he ran into some trouble. Um, but he, he seemed to tone it down and he's just solid and he gives you a guy who can get into fights, who can make some big hits, who can kind of look after some of those guys. The idea of right. If Zellweger pops and he can be your third, your third guy. I mean, yeah, dude, give me Zellweger Gudis. I don't think either one of them are six feet tall, but it's awesome. That's 
that's so hardcore. And, and I just think bringing in a guy like that who is going to do an inc- an incredibly strong and and sound job defensively while still having this kind of other edge to it, especially having lost Josh Manson, especially with Simon Benoit still being young. I, I it's 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 worth more than a little bit. Uh, as far as the benefit out of it, and again, he's already making two and a half million next year. Um, to your point about Gus Forsling, he may not be the guy they want to move because he is so steady, because he doesn't make that much. You know what I mean? But at the same time, if if you're Florida and you got to clear two and a half million dollars, there's worse ways to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, you you play a real strong attacking style, so you know maybe you think uh, having guys with a little bit more mobility or or, or offensive instincts helps. You know, it could go either way. If we end up with Forsling, great. If we ended up with Gudis, I'd be more than happy. I just think he provides a very particular dynamic to a team that needs it without, like you said before, sacrificing any of the actual shit we're asking you to do in a hockey game. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he's legitimately turned himself into an actual hockey player as well Mm -hmm. from the early days where it was, you know, the dirty hits and just being a, a physical guy who hit everything that moved. He does that in a smart way now, and he just seems like a more complete hockey player when you watch him. And you know, of course, a lot of that has to do with being in a good team as well. But he he's become a valuable player, I think, and and I, yeah. I really do like what he brings. And he's toned down the dirtiness that he had early in his mm-hmm. career. Like that classic hip check he threw this year was just that was so fun to watch. I haven't seen a guy throw a hit like that in a while. And he flipped him over, so that uh, yeah, he, I would love to have him here. I think he'd be great you know, playing with a guy like Fowler. I think that would be a, a lot mm-hmm. of do a lot of good for for Cam Fowler and and him being able to have a bit more freedom. Um, but hey, we're at the last pick. My last you got? dream target, like you said, tied in with Labushkin. It was Timothy Liljegren uh, from the Leafs. So L- Liljegren was the odd man out in the playoffs. Played two games out of the seven, not injured, uh, in favor of. TJ Brody, who plays on the right, being a left-handed defenseman, Labushkin and Justin Hall were the three right-hand shots. I was um, Riley, Muzzin, and uh, Giordano. Giordano on the left. So, yeah, Giordano not going to be back likely next year, I would imagine. Uh, maybe they bring him back, who knows. But he is the depending UFA on that roster. I would imagine it's Sandine who just takes that role on the left. Sandine injured during the playoffs, but the better of the two young defensemen and the one that fits into the Leafs roster a bit more. So Sandy and Lou are going to both pending our face. The rest of that blue line is back. They have contracts for next year. Um, so Lily Grin, again, like I said, seems like the odd man out. Could not find a consistent partner this year. Played with pretty much everybody. I think the highest percentage of his ice time of, with a pairing was like 10% of his ice time. So he played with a lot of different players Holy this year. Shit. He played on the left. He played with guys on the right. Like, he was all over the place with, in terms of who he played with. The thing that was consistent is his underlying numbers were great with all of them. Like, he looked <laughs> great with everybody he played with. And and a lot of that, again, is a testament to him and his individual impact of a player as a player. I think he has been kind of the, for some odd reason, the odd man out because Toronto has been looking to get – tougher and bigger on the back end so they opted for guys like the labushkin and and hall to offset you know the brodies and the muzzins and the in the rileys that they have who aren't you know the physical shot blocking heavy type defensemen so they brought in some of these other guys to kind of offset that and they opted to go with that against a, a you know a heavy team like tampa bay but even next year you know with the majority of these guys returning and sandine being the obvious choice to put in there how much longer can Liljegren be your seventh option, especially again with the contract being up and the Leafs being in in, in a tough uh, a tough cap position? So I looked at again as you do with with the Toronto situation, different ways to bring him in, and we've talked about trades in the past. But with Jack Campbell likely not returning, there's absolutely no way the Leafs go into next season with Mrazek as the starting netminder. The reports all say, oh, the Leafs aren't going to shake things up. If Jack Campbell's not coming back, they're they're doing something. They're bringing right. in a goaltender. And, of course, John Gibson's name comes up. So if there's some framework of a deal, I'm not going to get too into it here, but let's say it's Mrazek, Lilligren, and plus. something else. Plus, right? Like, there's a framework there to get a deal done. Is mm-hmm. you, you know, the, the Ducks bring back a netminder and Mrazek. The Leafs shed a bit of cap space in getting rid of Mrazek to make room for John Gibson. 
They move out the Lily Grand. They don't have to go into that that discussion to re-sign him for more than the league minimum entry level contract that he makes now. And and then the 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 you know the Ducks get something else, a pick, a prospect, or whatever from that deal. Um, and I I I really like Timothy Lilligren. I I really think he's been underrated and hasn't been given the right opportunity in Toronto. And he steps into a team in Anaheim where he could potentially be given a top four role. I know we're talking about third right-handed defense right now, the third pairing. But there's a there's a good chance again that he could play with, and I would really like to see him play with a player like Cam Fowler, um, or you know another you know Lily or uh, Zellweger or somebody else, another second pair option that we've talked about and bringing him in and slotting Shattenkirk down to the third pairing and playing with a guy like Benoit, where we saw them actually have some success this year, and with Shattenkirk in a reduced role as a third pairing guy at five on five and a second power play option that really allowed him to kind of come into his own and, and be a better player this year. So, yeah, I, I have a lot of love for, for Timothy Lilligren, and if there was ever a trade with the Leafs, of all the prospects and young players they have, he would be near the top, if not at the top of my list of guys to acquire. Yeah, I, I you know, to be completely honest, I don't have a ton of familiarity with him. Um you know, I, I think, you know, I've seen him play when I've watched Toronto here and there, but it's just one of those things, like, I don't really have much, uh, you know, kind of in my, my memory bank about him, but he's a name that I've heard Leafs fans talk about for a while as being a guy who can take that next step, who can join that defense court, who can, you know, pro- provide some dynamism uh, or, or, or some uh, some skill to, to that lineup. But like we talked about um I think we talked about this on the last episode, but we, we were talking about, uh, you know, like Nick Robertson. You're either a full-time guy or you're not. We don't have time to wait. Yeah. And if you're not going to let this guy develop in either a bottom pair role or in the minors, like you said, what's the value of having this guy just sit there in a seventh in a seventh defenseman role and just kind of get stale? Uh, you, you don't want those guys to die on the vine. And if you can turn that into something that helps you, whether – whether it's someone like Simone Benoit, just provide a little bit of that physicality, right? Or uh, Gibson or a pick or whatever, you know, or attach him to Mrazek. There's a lot of ways there for them to turn, again, this is the kind of the gross part of sports, but it's true, turn to L- Timothy Lilligren into some assets, either whether that's cap space, whether that's controlled players or, or, or whatever it is. They have an opportunity to make something happen with him because, like you said, they're not going to give up Sandine. Apparently, they're, you know, Sheldon Keefe is in love with Justin Hall. So, you know, it, it just kind of seems like it is what it is at this point. I, I, he's a really interesting choice, and I, I would love to see him uh, kind of brought over. That would be a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's been, um, you know, the, the like we'd mentioned, the underlying numbers, like a, a very solid play driver kind of I, I, out of nowhere. Um, and again, he's a, he's a guy that I haven't watched a ton of, but anytime I've seen him play, he is one of those guys that you you notice like he's he's the typical Swedish defenseman, and he you know he plays the game the right way if you want to call it that right, like his steady defensive two way game, but he's got a little bit of that you know offensive flair to him, the ability to kind of carry the puck up the ice and and enter the zone. He's got a little bit of you know stick handling and puck handling ability that you know, he can kind of sh- show on, on occasion that you normally don't see from from some of those defensemen. So he's got this potential to him that you can see like they're scratching the surface of it. He's I believe a former first round pick, so there is obviously something there when when they took him. So for Anaheim, we've talked about this at the, uh, you know at the um, the deadline show we did and even some of the the off-season prediction shows that the Ducks are in that point right now where they should be looking at guys who are 21, 22, 23 that either haven't been given the opportunity yet or are or, or about to kind of hit their, their breakout period here that teams can't keep for whatever reason. And I think Lily Ergen kind of fits that mold as one of those guys that the Leafs, I'm sure, don't want to get rid of him. But because of the situation they're in right now, he might be available because, you know, they prefer Hall and, and the contract he has and Labushkin and what what those two bring in, in a physical side of the game. They've got, you know, the three horses locked down and Brody and Muzzin and Riley. Um, and then Sandine's going to come in and, and fill the spot for for Giordano. And 
the window is now for Toronto, right? Like you have to win now. And if you're not going to blow things up and you're not going to move Nylander, because you're not, like you had mentioned earlier, you're not moving the other three, there's not much else you can do. And the goaltender is clearly the one position the Leafs need to figure out. Uh, you know, that was the one thing really keeping them from potentially being the best team in the, in, in the entire league this year. When you looked at um, the rest of the cat, like the rest of their <clears throat> team stats and things like goals for even their, their team defense, everything was either one, two, three, or top 10 in the league, except for save, team save percentage. Like it was rock bottom. So I like Jack Campbell. I like Peter Morazic, but if, the cost of getting a player like John Gibson for Toronto is Timothy Lilligren and some picks and prospects. I think you, you get it done, right? You have it, – it's a cost you have to pay to try and compete and win now. Very excited for future Anaheim Duck, Topi Niemela. Yeah, yeah, you could – if it was Topi um, Niemela, if it was Lilligren, Niemela, and Mrazek – would you do that for John Gibson? We're, we're going to get into the weeds here in a long discussion, but if it was I just pro- those three pieces, would you I do it? I probably would. I think I probably would, if for no other reason than I'm not sure you're going to get a much better return than that for a goalie at this point, especially a goalie who has been up and down the last couple of years on paper. Yeah, uh, three seasons who, now for John Gibson. Yeah, you know, and, and is he's, what, 27, 28? Like, he's getting there. So, uh, you know, any, any real opportunity for him to still be the goalie that I at least firmly believe he's still more than capable of if he's given a a, a decent situation uh, which hilarious to say that about Toronto but still um 29 in July John Gibson yeah you know so I, I mean I think I would make that deal I, th- I really think I would I think Topani Emila has the upside I think Lilligren has the potential and, and I like Brassic. I, you know, I, I don't it's think not he's a bad option, great, right? But like, he's he's a perfectly fine one A one B, and if it's Stolarz and Mrazek next year, fuck, man, I don't care. That's fine with me. Yeah, you're not expecting anything, and and who, like we've seen we've seen Mrazek in different situations be a legitimate close to starting netminder, right? A guy who can maybe he can't do sixty, but he can do a forty forty split, right? Like he mm-hmm. can he I can he, make, can he can make that happen. I think that's possible. Um, and and listen, like if the if if that's the best package on the table for John Gibson, we've said it multiple times. Like this, if you're gonna move him, this is the off season to do it, because mm-hmm. I don't think you can afford another bad season on the books. Because right yeah. now it is four good seasons versus three bad ones, uh, or I guess five good ones as a I don't know four good ones as a starter. Because he had, he only played twenty three games in fourteen fifteen. So you've got fifteen sixteen with forty games played, a nine twenty save percentage. You've got sixteen seventy uh, seventeen fifty two games played, a nine twenty four save percentage. You've got seventeen eighteen sixty games played, a nine twenty six save percentage. That's absurd. And fifty eight games played in twenty eighteen nineteen, and a nine seventeen save percentage. Those are the four good seasons. The last three. 904 save percentage, 903 save percentage, and 904 save percentage in 51, 35, and 56 games played. So, I mean, obviously, yes, the team has been worse in those years, but I don't think you can afford a 50 50 split of good and bad seasons. I think you got to take No, I don't think you can. And, and, I, and I think the teams that are looking for goaltenders that are desperate will will make those moves this offseason and, and they'll make it happen. The, the amount of suitors are going to go down if you wait another year. So if that's the best deal on the table. It's not the worst one in the world when you think of a team that is really hurting for right-handed defensemen. If you could bring in two real good young ones, one who can play next year in Lilligren and one who's a couple years away in Niemela, it's not bad. It's not bad no, at all. Not at all. Um, all right, well, I'm I'm pretty sure it's July for you now. Uh, I think yeah, we've been recording for six weeks. If anybody, if anybody has listened to this, and and not in two parts, if you listen to this almost three hour show straight through and you had three hours of time, I I commend you. That is amazing. I don't think I've ever sat sat down and listened to a three hour video. You can listen to it in parts. <laughs> I, I, look, I've been in this conversation for all three hours, and I'm pretty sure I haven't listened to the whole thing. So, no. just of it uh, is, we need Matthew Kachuk. I don't care about anything else. We just need no. Matthew that's Kuchuk. that's pretty much it. Give yeah. me Matty Kachuk and Peter Mrazek, and I'm going to be a happy boy next year. <laughs> all right. Well, um, yeah, that uh, that wraps it up. I don't know if you wanted to um, 
talk about a little i don't like we we've loosely planned some upcoming shows no because every time we do that we end up not, not doing, doing any it yeah and i just i can't do that we have if somebody did sit through draft hours content of shit. coming there you go we have vague draft content coming at some point yeah, i'm not telling excited. you what or how many shows there will be at least one draft show maybe more before the draft <laughs> oh. in july so and then I guess the one other show that we can definitely say is going to happen is after all the awards are announced, we will have uh, Robin and uh, PD back on to go over your guys' uh, choices for blind award picks. Mm-hmm. So that should be fun to revisit because I'm pretty yeah. so After Zegers uh, wins the Calder, right? Yeah, exactly. Not Michael Bunting. Not Michael Bunting. I, I mean, it's going to be – never mind. I'm not doing this right don't now. Don't say it. Don't say it. It's not okay. going to be cited. Uh, all right. Um, again, like Eddie said, thank you so much for anybody who one part, seven parts, whatever. Uh, this was just something we thought was fun. We thought, uh, you know, an interesting conversation. I, I feel at least like we were at least pretty close and accurate on that. Um, gave us a chance to talk about some, some stuff in a different way and still do some of the, the fake GM shit we love so much. So, uh, we'll talk to you guys sooner than later, hopefully. And thanks everybody. Be well. Bye guys.